Alrighty, I'm here. Um, I'm here with uh, <laughs> with an old mate. His name's Don Velix. Yeah, man. Say hello. Hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> What's doing, everybody? This is Don doing stuff. You can find me on Instagram, Instagram. at Don doing stuff. Yep. Or I'm just gonna plug myself just straight away. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Plug, plug, give yourself a plug straight away, and, and then we'll then we'll, we'll sort of uh, go backwards and, and break it down from there. But Don yeah. doing stuff dot online. Pop that into your URL. Dub dub dub. Don doing stuff dot online. All right. So I was I was just um actually trying to uh, work this back in my own head when when um I was hitting you up and saying hey let's do a podcast together. Yeah. Um, and so I was, I was messaging, um, Jason Q or Jason Tran about it. And I was like, shout out to Jason. Yeah. And I was like, when, when did, when did I actually meet Don? And then I think we, we sort of traced it back to Christian Joseph's music video. Mm. Yeah. Cause, um, so this, what was the song called? I can't remember. So I was managing Christian Joseph at the time. Um, and I had written a song called Fool for You. Yes. So what he did was he, he took that, he, um, he took that, that right, the written song reproduced it um and like you know we released it as a track for christian joseph yep and that was that song that we worked on yeah that's around the same time that i met jason yep um we met you because we, you you got brought on to help with the music video yeah and the and i had the car yes the fj cruiser <laughs> yellow fj cruiser <laughs> shout out toyota motor corporation australia <laughs> <laughs> anyway it was my company car so yeah um, no, that was really cool that yeah. like i i didn't even know that um we had that type of connects like yep. i was working with it working with jason on that video and he's like i can get a cool car i'm like cool whatever you whatever you feel is best yeah then let's make this happen um i don't even know if that video is still online oh really so it, it, where is christian joseph nowadays like, I, so I, yeah so he's pivoted from being an artist into more so a producer okay so he's he's producing for a lot of the local artists in sydney okay wow um yeah, he's 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 gone a little low key, but his music is starting to pick up again because yep. because yeah, he's he's producing for people like uh, Timba, aka Tim Bautista, LOC, um, Zoilo, uh, who was originally Heartbreak Kev, uh, other artists in, in in the industry here in Sydney. So okay. that's really cool. Anyway, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let, let's let's pair it back a little bit. So let's um let's start with this. So how would what would you describe that yourself nowadays? Like what what would you say you do? <laughs> um, apart from doing stuff <laughs> yeah i think see i thought about this like because there were different parts and i think we were talking about this Just prior before. to recording yeah that there were everything about me was kind of compartmentalized yeah right there's don who's the musician there's don who's the um the, the nerd or the like the brain and then there's don who was into fitness and um don who's kind of funny i don't i don't feel like i'm funny yeah um inherently but um, I've made stuff that has gone viral yep. that, that is kind of funny. Yep. Um, and what I wanted to do was solidify and um, connect all of those things, collect all of those things together. Yep. And cause that's who I am. Yep. Um, and that's, that's the, that's how Don doing stuff came about. Yep. Cause I wanted to kind of encapsulate the, the music, the, the fitness, the, the, the funny stuff, all, all of the things that make me, me. Yep. Yeah. And put it all together in, in into one sort of, you know, I guess iteration. Yeah, that, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that 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 that's I guess visible and you know people can connect with kind of a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's um, yeah, because I, I I realized that Don Valix the musician was a brand in itself. Yeah. Right? And Don Valix who the person was completely different to that. Yeah. So Don doing stuff is just a collection of stuff that I do. Yeah. <laughs> so See, I, to say I, it basically. I, yeah, I, I really I always struggle with this this whole. Um, brand stuff mm. you know um when i when i think about it um so I, I i have this really sort of philosophical way that i view this right and it, and it comes back to martial arts and i know you you're, you've you dabbled and you, you've got some martial arts experiences but all that we'll shit we'll, we'll delve into a bit later but yeah. um you know i always put it back to um you know when we talk about labels and names mm. right so as an example um a simple way to to put it is if we say um boxing right mm -hmm. where it's the art of using your fists right yep. and and boxing has become a specific style with a specific rule set mm -hmm. right um and it's almost like you know i guess if you look at the analogy of a a square can be a rectangle or sorry a rectangle can be yeah a rectangle can be a square wait mm -hmm. have i I've, I'm, this is the old you know like it can be one way but it can't be the other way right um so a rectangle can be a wait a rectangle can be a square 
Yeah, a rectangle can be a square. But a square is never a rectangle. Never a, a rectangle. In the, in the sense that the dimensions aren't right. Yeah. equal. As, right? the, yeah, as the definition. Yeah, of a as square, the definition, yeah. right? So, so um, you know, from that perspective, like um, boxing is a style of martial arts, mm. right? But martial arts, in, by I guess that label, encapsulates all styles yep. of fighting or self defense or blah, 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 like yep. by the nature of the term, right? So then, you know, when you put a label on something, um, we, it allows people to then uh, get focus and um, develop ability and have a structure, mm. right? But then when you get to a certain point, you need to take away the structure to actually really allow something to flourish. Yep. Right? And I, I think this is probably a very Bruce Lee type of philosophy where, you know, um, you, know it, it, you, you can use that structure to get really good at something, but then at some point you need to take away the structure because now the structure is actually a cage. It's inhibiting your abilities Absolutely. to go further. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so, you know, I've always struggled with this, um, this whole brand concept because even like throughout my working career, I never really thought about um, a brand per se. I, I, I do think about reputation and I think about, you know, being somebody that people can look to and, and, and trust mm. um, and who can de- develop good relationships and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, um, like when I try and up, I, I'm the shittest marketer when it comes to my own stuff, right? <laughs> like you know, I, I'm I'm, ha- I'm happy to be the face of MacArthur BMW. If you look, if you go to their Instagram, you'll see me on videos left, right, and center. Nice, always producing content for that, <laughs> right? Yeah, like free plug for them. But um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm the face of that business. But when it comes to my own stuff, like I can't even. I I, I try. I think I put you know hashtags on on one of my podcast posts, and then I couldn't be asked. Like I just, it's it's. You know, I, I guess, you know, I, I, what I struggle with is that I, I don't do it for that purpose. I, I do it because I enjoy the conversations and hopefully, you know, I, I guess, you know, um, I'm relying on other people if they enjoy what I do mm. to then share it for me. So it's, it's, it's the real lazy approach and I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> but, but like, that's, that's just the way that I look at it, right? Whereas, um, you know, like when we were talking before and, you know, lis- listening to you when you talk, you know, you, you, you're always looking at how, to blend the two, you know, you've got a much more balanced approach than what I have. Mm. Um, you know, on the bell curve, I'm, I'm probably, you know, in that, you know, 10% on one of the, the sides and you're mm. much more in the middle, you know, trying to understand the metrics and how, how do those things, you know, get put together. Yeah. Um, and I think, and I think it's, it's really about your motivation for the podcast, right? Yeah. Um, this, if I feel like this is a, a passion project for you yep. and it's more about you remembering your friends and you, um, being in touch with your friends and giving your friends a platform to express themselves. Mm. It's not necessarily something that you're not trying to market to people. Mm. This is just your, this is your time capsule. Like, as you said, yeah. that, like prior to us recording, this is your time capsule for you and your friends. Yep. So to market that um, would take away from what your actual purpose of it is, yeah. you know, um, for us as the cheat coders and, for context out there, I have another podcast called The Cheat Coders Podcast. Uh, shout outs. Go to cheatcoders.com. I'm just going to plug <laughs> yeah, as much as I can. <laughs> plug, plug all the way through. Right? But yeah, like, and yeah. so what we do is we try to promote uh, creatives in, in Sydney. Yep. Um, we wanted to showcase a lot of the talent and, um, you know, entrepreneurship that is happening in Western Sydney, mm. but to a greater extent, anything that's happening in Australia. Okay. Um, and and how what was the what was and I, I I've sort of broken my normal structure you know in this court podcast because we're already sort of you know going on these different um, sort of engines, stories and I yeah. I, w- I want to go through them you know so what was like the the genesis of that podcast like how did that start that started with two of my mates so they were uh, so my my two friends Raf Flores and um, Nats Dela Cruz or Nathan Dela Cruz aka Nats Blazon. Um, they wanted to start a podcast. This was the inception of this was probably a little over two years ago. Yep. Right. They started and they were like, Hey, I, we want to be able to communicate better with people. Mm. We want to be able to have conversations and talk about things. Um, and so they got together, recorded themselves in a Starbucks uh, parking lot. Yep. And that was the beginning of the Cheat Coders podcast. Wow. What, is that just on an f- iPhone or something? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. On phone, all right. Um, and that's when they started. And I was living in Singapore at the time. Okay. And I was inspired by them. Yep. And I thought, um, being in Singapore, I was away from friends and from, from, yep. from family. Yeah. 
And I wanted to kind of reconnect with friends as well. Mm. So I was like, I'm going to start a podcast because yep. I'm inspired by these guys. And I started a podcast called uh, The Roman Empire, as okay. in like Rome, R-O-A-M, yep. Roman Empire. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to find the that question, does travel inspire art or does art inspire travel? Mm -hmm. And so I was interviewing a lot of my friends who are creatives. Um, Jason, Jason Q yep. is one of those people that I interviewed because he got to travel because of his career. Yep. Um, and yeah, for me, it was about very, very similar to your podcast. And I was saying this earlier that I wanted to kind of um, build a legacy or build a time capsule for my friends mm. as well. And yep. all, yeah. Anyway, so fast forward as well, the Nats and Raf wanted me to be a guest on their podcast. Yep. So we were interviewing, Nats was living in London, Raf was here in Sydney, I was in Singapore. And so we Skyped each other recorded it, sent it off. And we realized that we had a really good dynamic amongst yep. the three of us. And we're like, they, they asked me to join the podcast. Yep. And then, yeah, that's how it started. I, I think I started, I think I joined on around episode 30. Yep. And then we built it into what it is now. And we're up to 200, close to 220 episodes yep. of the podcast. Um, more focused, um, more centric around what is happening in Western Sydney and trying to build that community and that culture of, um, mm. of art in Western Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's really, it's, a, it's one of those, um, I find, you know, podcasting to be this really interesting sort of platform, but I, I, I view it almost like, um, like a book, you know, um, mm. the difference is that, you know, most times when you get a book, it's gone through so many different uh, drafts to give you the final polished product. Yeah. Whereas a podcast is a little bit more raw than that. You know, well, it depends on the podcast, but mine is like basic, basic, like raw as can be because I, I love I, that though. I love it. <laughs> like I don't edit nothing. I just, you know, I amplify the vol volume to get the levels right. And then basically that's it. I, I like, I'm so budget. I don't, I haven't set up an intro. I don't like, don't really introduce my people very well, but that's what my captions are for, I guess. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll write it. I'll write an extensive caption to try and, you know, um, get the essence of, you know, what that conversation was about. Yeah. But, um, you know, one of the things I always like to talk about, you know, is, is that um, when you think in terms of history, right, um, everything was sort of like information was communicated as a story, mm. right? So whether it was, you know, uh, Indigenous people and, and, and I guess, you know, the dream time, right? Like they're, commuting, they're communicating those stories, but in those stories there is information that allows those people to follow the guidelines on how to live and, 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 ha and have a life. Yeah. Right. Um, it could relate to you know things that you should be able to eat and that you shouldn't be able to eat. Mm. Right. So there'll be a story. I'm sure, and I'm 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 sorry if this offends any indigenous people that I'm I'm probably butchering it, but like I'm sure there'll be stories about certain animals and that you know they'd be demons or scary or whatever that you shouldn't eat because they're poisonous. Mm. And likewise, you know, there'd be other animals that you'd um, praise and. Um, one, you know, it sounds like you're describing religion in itself. Well, and, and hey, <laughs> or like a type, a type of that. Like it, yeah, and it, it is like that. Right? Yeah, and and we, we were talking about this before as well. Like yeah. um, narratives versus objective, yeah. like storytelling or objective information giving. Yeah, um, and yeah, that's exactly what podcasting is like. You yeah. can, you can, you can give that narrative view of yep. podcasting where mm -hmm. if if it's very, um, and not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but if it's very polished. Mm and um delivered in a way that is okay it's 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 you want it to be succinct yep and you want it to give a particular message mm. yes it, podcasting can do that but at the same time you've got um your podcast my podcast we mm. we like to have it very conversational very mm. cards on the it's table open. like the open. idea is that that you know i'm, I'm not married to any ideology it's mm. you know I, I i credit podcasts to opening my eyes and and my mind to a, a wide array of different thought patterns and, yeah. and logic right so if any of my conversations um that i have with people can also do the same for other people well hey that's that's a bonus right like to me that's 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 a win you know like i love that um you know because uh, you know if i didn't have uh, if i didn't listen to some of those podcasts and 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 start pondering on some of those ideas i, mm. I probably wouldn't develop my own ideas right and so when you think about you know your own identity as we were talking about before um, that comes from accumulation of your experience, mm -hmm. right? And this is why, you know, I think there's so much um, struggle for younger people to try and find an identity before you've even had a, ch a chance to form one, right? Yeah. Or create a brand, yeah, yeah. right? Before you've even had a chance to form your, formulate your own opinion. 
let alone like your first opinions or your first I- ideologies are probably always going to be shit. Yeah. Because they're not tested. They haven't been challenged. Mm. And depending on where you sit on the scale, you, you might be unconsciously incompetent and view that that's, that's the only way that to view the world. Mm. But until you suddenly, you know, start to get a little bit more conscious that, hey, there are other ways to, to look at this perspective or look at it from different perspectives and then start to consider other, other expect perspectives that, you know, um, it's sort of like almost like a, you know, when we talk about art, right, like mm. it's that, that sculpture. You're chipping away at the rock to form an identity or form a, a yeah. framework, right? Yeah. And um, so, you know, when you're when you're so when you when you're young, you're, you're so impressionable that you know it, it, you haven't even become a rock. It's still soft clay. It's being mm-hmm. molded. Absolutely. Right? And then after it after it starts to harden, that's when you can start to chip away and really fine tune and get those yeah. you know um, those really um, honed in perspectives. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's true nowadays. Um, and I think I've heard it being said, and I say it a lot as well that um kids nowadays i sound old when i say that kids nowadays um they have to build a brand before they build an identity it's yeah. exactly what you're saying they they their ideologies their their perspectives are aren't fully formed yeah. but because of social media yeah they have to create something that yeah. is and that shit's out there for like you know it can be out there forever. Forever, yeah, right? absolutely. And, and w- whereas, you know, when we were growing up, like that, that wasn't the case. You know, you're you, allowed you, to make mistakes. Multiple mistakes, <laughs> right? <laughs> multiple mistakes, and we're going to talk about a few of them because <laughs> we got through this podcast, so they're out there forever, so that other people can fucking learn from them. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully we don't get arrested from <laughs> talking about our mistakes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, all right, let's um, let's let's start to hit that rewind button. We'll go. We'll yeah. try and get back into, I guess, a more familiar structure for people, but. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So, um, where where did you grow up? I grew up here in Sydney. Okay. So I was born in the Philippines. Yep. But I, um, my parents migrated here when I was very young. Okay. Um, and then yeah. So I, so young that you can't remember migrating here, or yeah, pretty much. Yep. I mean, I I have vague memories. Yep. But possibly if like years of drinking probably taken that away. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> but like if, when you when you're a child. Yeah, as you grow up, you, you forget your memories, your childhood memories. Yep. I have vague memories of being, like, in the Philippines, but they, they could have just been influenced by photos that yep. I've seen. Yep. Um, you know. And what, what would your earliest memory be? Wow. I think the earliest memory now is when we first moved to Australia. Yep. Um, we were living in Cogra at the time. Okay. And one of the things that, um, it's a story that I remember, I remember vividly. Yep. Because my dad talks about it a lot is that you know he would want we would we, he would want to take us to my uncle's house who lived oh, i don't know maybe 45 minutes walk away or some some yeah. some distance right it doesn't it doesn't matter for the story but we were going to go to my uncle's house to have lunch okay and we didn't want to like eat like whatever they had we were just like oh we were kids we yeah. wanted maccas for yeah. instance yeah so my dad said hey let's go to mcdonald's right <laughs> What tricked you guys? And we're like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and here's a tip for any of the parents out there. Um, it's like the carrot or stick kind of motivation. Yeah. Um, and we can talk about more of that later because um, that's that's really interesting for, for learning. But he was like, uh, let's go to McDonald's. And we're like, yeah, let's go to McDonald's. And so we'd walk and we'd get to McDonald's and we're like, yes, yes, we're going to get McDonald's. He's like, oh, no, I think there's one a little further up the, yeah. the road. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Oh, he's like, oh, no, maybe we'll go to Red Rooster or something. He would just, he just kept, kept pushing that, yeah, that, that boundary, that boundary, like, or the, that goal. Yep. He just kept moving the goalpost. And then eventually get to my uncle's house. And then we're like, oh, we're here at, we're here at your uncle's house. We may as well eat food here now. Yep. Like, and that's yeah. how he got us to, to, <laughs> to get, get those things. Um, yeah. That's that, my earliest memory of like being in Australia. Wow. That, 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 that. <laughs> Does that form the basis of any trust issues? With your yes. Dad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if your first, if your first memory is getting deceived by your dad, to, yes, to get to your uncle's place. To yes. Be. Um. And yeah, like, and I think in terms of learning, it's funny because now when goalposts have to change, mm. there's a slight aversion in me to, to kind of try to reach that next, that next goalpost. Yeah, because you feel like, oh, like this isn't going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's you'll never actually get to the what, like that goalpost. That goalpost yeah. It's like if you're aiming for Maccas and you never actually get to Maccas. Yeah. Then what's the point of actually trying? Yeah. You know, if that goalpost always moves. Yep. Um. Yeah. I, I think because of that, 
Yeah. And I'm just thinking about it now. Because of that, yeah, there's a slight aversion. There's a there's a there's a part of me that's just like, what's the point? Yeah. You know, if yeah. things are gonna change, then why should I bother? Yeah. Which is a really horrible mindset to have. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's funny, you know, um, the way that some of these things can can influence you. Yeah. Um, and you just you don't you don't think about it. like I me personally. Um, there's even things that I pick up just from like I was listening to I was listening to an audio book, um, on um, I think it's called Raising Lions or something. But it's it's basically about like a, a book about how to how to you know um, uh, raise kids, mm. right? And um, do you have kids? Yeah. Okay. I did. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah, I've got two. Well, um, you and I have not seen each other for years, and I think, and yeah. I think, yeah, we, um, I think our interaction was just basically just that that project, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and I think we might have hung out once or twice, yep. but man, it's crazy. Yeah. But sorry, you go, go yeah. on. You read a, you listened to an audiobook. Yeah, and and it was about um, I think it's called Raising Lions or something like that. But basically, how um, the way that. The, the, the structure in society now is that we try and empower children, you know, and empower, empower the youth to be more responsible and mm. be able to make their own decisions. But we don't have um, the the correct framework to raise them effectively. So a lot that's why, you know, a lot of kids can develop behavioural issues because they have this, you know, um, very narcissistic view of how the world is. Yeah. Um, and... You know, um, so how how we interact with our children, like you know, you can't we we can't expect to go back to the authoritarian styles of parenthood where you know you do something wrong, you get smacked, yeah. right? Like, um, so there are there are better ways than that because that particular style was probably the right style um, at the time in the yeah in the in the what nineteen hundreds or nineteen fifties when things were a lot more strict, right? Mm. So we notice that you know thing um, the rules um, probably have been relaxed. Um, a lot more when it comes to raising children, mm. but that that all it means is that the methods that we use to raise our kids needs to be updated as well. Absolutely. Right? And so then I was like, um, when I was listening to this audio book, and then I was like, oh shit, some of this stuff really speaks to me from like, <laughs> you know, what why I'm so the way I am, you know, like mm. why I'm so impatient, and um, you know, um, a lot of a lot of times my um, impatience to achieve things can be taken the wrong way as like, you know, like I can be too intense for some people just because I have that, I don't have that, you know, for me, like, I, and I, let me sort of, um, I think I know what you mean though. Preface it. Like, I guess. Yeah. So in, in um, my parents both ran their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So I spent a large, and my brother was seven years older than me. So um, even from a young age, like my parents would always um, either be at work and my brother would be the babysitter. Mm -hmm. Right. And then obviously my brother being seven years older than me, you, you, if you think about it like this, like let's say um, I'm five and he's 12, right? Mm. He wants to do 12-year-old things. Yep. He doesn't look after a five-year-old, right? Um, and so I think that that probably shaped my brother and that's why he's such a responsible person in that regard. Um, but on the flip side, you know, it made me very self-reliant in that sense. So mm. if I want something, I'll go and do it myself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a parent would probably say, "Hey, don't don't do that because you're only five. You know, you're going to hurt yourself." Mm -hmm. But a twelve year old brother is just going to be, like, "Ah, yeah, let him do whatever he wants. Like I'm going to focus on him on on my own thing." Yeah. And so you know, I got away with doing whatever I wanted for so long. Yeah. That um that even you know throughout my my teenage years, like I I was probably very very hard to control for my parents. Um, <laughs> so like you know, I, and why I say that is because you know I'd have nights where even my, when I talk about my mate who um passed away last year you know we would game until like you know 2 a.m in the morning yeah and for most probably what uh 14 no not 14 but maybe like 15 15 year old kids teenagers yeah. you know you'd, you'd get sent to your room you'd, you'd get told to go to sleep yeah right and I'd just keep playing <laughs> right and do my own thing and sort of just I, I guess I'd, I'd sort of bulldoze my way to what I wanted yep um and you know that 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 was um, that had its own challenges, you know. And then when I when I moved into the work world, you know, and um, and unfortunately, a lot of the structures in in um, in I guess the working environment don't lend itself to um, that, that sort of, of yeah. That like you know, at a certain level, yeah, you, you're entitled. You, I guess not entitled, but you know, you, you've at a certain level, you've earned the right to be um, very demanding. You know, as if you're if you're a boss and that kind of thing. Right, mm. but as an employee, to be um, to have that same sort of uh, intensity and that want, wanting to succeed, 
um, can turn off a lot of managers if you're in the corporate world because they view you as a threat, right? That's, that's yeah, that's a sad, that, I, and I, I, I agree. That's a sad way of looking at it. But the, like me listening to you talk about this makes me think of um, someone who is really, really driven and really like one, like has this yearning to succeed. Yeah. And that sort of person needs to be nurtured and that sort of mentality needs to be nurtured. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I, I understand it's, um, I, I, I'm the eldest of three boys, yep. right? And so I was the responsible one. Yep. Or in quotation marks, responsible yep. one. So what, what's the age gap between you and your brothers? Um, we're only a couple of years apart. Okay. So my, my second brother, Ken, um, is two years younger than me. And then yep. my other brother, John, um, he's one year younger than Ken. Okay. Yep. So we're very, very, close, very close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, my, my parents were, would, would work. And when, from a young age, I would be the one who would be, be babysitting. Yep. Um, because, yeah, migrating to, to Australia, they needed to work. They yep. needed to support the family. Both of them needed yep. to. Um, and, um, well, they can't get in trouble now, but leaving a 12-year-old boy <laughs> to take care of some kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they, that's what happened. And that pushed me to be a lot more responsible or have to be responsible yep. to be the man of the house. Um and yeah, I, I think I, I just talking about about your perspective of it as well, and in terms of like, because uh, I really, really like that mindset, mm. like of wanting to succeed at something mm. so much that you like, you don't care if um, it offends other people, yeah, right? Because I think that's a really, really good mindset. Yes, it may you may step on other people's toes, but as long as you're not hurting people yeah. in that regard. Because mm. managers who feel like, oh, you're going to take over my job if you succeed. Yeah. Like, shouldn't be managers. Like, yeah. that's not that's not a, the best way. If you want to lead people, if you want to manage people, you yeah. should be nurturing there. Yeah. Like, so that they can help you to be better as well. Yeah. Like, for, for me, if I have a team that helps me to do my job, that makes me better yeah. as a manager. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is basically like, I, I commend that, that mindset. <laughs> and I think now that's the person that I am now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, taking it back to that whole moving the goalpost thing yeah. Yeah. and that, that idea of change when it comes to learning something for me now, I'm trying to lean into learning from change and adapting from change. Yeah. And, and even if it means that, um, Yes, it's going to be difficult in that first little um, learning curve. Yep. Setback. That little setback, yep. yeah. That um, what I can gain from that, like gain from the experience is the biggest thing. That's yep. the biggest impact. That should be the, the that should be the, um, the goal. The goal. Yep. Right? Yep. It's not about the, it's not about getting Mac, is it? But it's about, okay, what's the distance? Yeah, it's the journey. Yeah, it's, it definitely is. Yep. Um, and taking it back to that story of my dad, like what's the learning that I can get from that? Yep. The learning is that my dad wanted to spend time with us. Yep. It d didn't matter if it was 45 minutes of walking. Yep. You know, because I think for him, he thought as soon as we get to my uncle's place, we're just going to do our own thing. Yep. But there was a moment in time, like for 45 minutes, we were a unit. We were a family and we were yep. just... Be together. Be together. That's yep. what that's what I see now. Yeah. Like, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry to say I don't know which direction I'm, I'm taking yeah, it. But. That's right. That's right. So okay. So then, um, so when you, when, um, so for you was was English was spoken at home or were you speaking uh, Tagalog or? So I, that's another story that I, I, I remember from childhood, but only because my dad tells his story. Okay. I was the reason, I was part of the reason why we came here to Sydney, okay. to Australia. Why is that? So. Um, my dad's quite crafty and he's very like, um, uh, what's the word? I guess crafty or resourceful is the mm -hmm. is the word. Um, I, I give him credit for it. Um, we were in Philippines and my family wasn't like very wealthy. We, we were okay. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a view of like if you are very, very wealthy and if you speak English in the Philippines, you're wealthy. Yeah. Right. They must have taught me English or somehow like – I picked it up very easily yep. from a young age. Um, so I was speaking English. Okay. Well, I'm like two. Yep. 
and we went to the immigration office and my dad was applying to uh to get it you know to, to be able to migrate to sydney we had um asked my dad had asked a friend of theirs to dress up in a nurse's outfit okay so as if we had a maid like yep. it was as, as if to see that we had a maid, maid. Yeah, and money. so we looked like we had money. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so we rocked up, and my dad was, you know, they did their interview, immigration interview, or whatever it was, and they were saying, "Oh, you know, so you've got two kids?" And like, yeah, my dad, dad was like, "Yep." Yeah. And they were like looking around. Was your was your was your other kid? They only had my brother Ken with them. He was yeah. one years old. And my dad was like, "Oh, he's he's out of the office, and he's." I was chatting apparently according to my dad I was chatting to all of their employees in yeah. English yeah and just like having conversations with everyone yeah and they were like your son speaks English <laughs> I'm like yeah of course of course he does <laughs> and like and, and they're like well okay and then you know they I, I as the story goes from that that point the okay. stamp and then we migrated to Australia oh wow um I and my parents tried to learn English. Um, my mom really, really tried to lean into it. And so she has an Australian accent. Yep. She can still speak the Tagalog yep. um, quite fluently. Both of them can. Yep. I think my dad still holds on to the, the Filipino accent, accent and that, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, it's pride. It's, yeah, it's a, it is a pride <laughs> thing. Um, but he, yeah. So, but I was learning English because my parents were learning English. Yep. And my brothers and I became the ones to teach them English. Yep. Like my, my mom would come home. <laughs> I remember the story. My mom came home one day and she's like, um, my mom doesn't have a Filipino accent, but I always, in my head, she does. And I was like, uh, she's like, guys, uh, what is, um, what is snat? What is snat? <laughs> right? And I'm like, what? what are you, how did this come up? And what was the context of it? <laughs> and she's like, oh, my, my friend said, oh, sorry, I have snat in my nose. Like, like that was, <laughs> that was the, that we were like, oh, okay. It's, it's like booger. It's, yeah. you know, um, it's what's the word for it? What's the English word? It's not. It, it's <laughs> not like it's. <laughs> it is not. It's crusty, crusty yeah. um, mucus in your nose. Oh, yeah, mucus. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. Fine, that, sorry, I was trying to find the scientific <laughs> term. <laughs> but yeah, that, and that was it. And so, my brothers and I were the English teachers to my yeah. to my parents. And now, when I'm speaking to people, they're like, "Oh, so you were born in the Philippines?" Like, yeah. Like, you don't have a Filipino accent. Yeah. I'm like. It's because I grew up in Australia, Australia. and yeah. I identify myself more as Australian than Filipino. Filipino. Yep. Um, I mean, we could talk about that as well. There's, there's that. Um, I'm not sure. That, were you born here? Or so you? I was born here. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, people who uh, who are like second generation uh, migrants yep. struggle with this, like this identity, identity. right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and I don't know if you've talked about it with other people, but like when Growing up here, they were always like, "Oh, you're Filipino, or you're Asian," and that's the that's your identity. That's the identity that people, the label that people give you. Mm. But then, uh, when I go back to the Philippines, I'm Australian. Yeah, you know, and yeah. I don't belong in in either in, in either camp in either camp. Yeah, and it it's a weird place to sit. Yep, you know. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. I always um. So I don't I don't know if I've told this story in the podcast before, but it, it is a story that I often think about. When I think about my first sort of awareness that um, as an Asian kid I was different to mm. other people, so um, when I was at primary school, there was this other kid, and um, I think his name was Jason, and I'm uh, uh, another <laughs> Jason, but he was, a, he was a he was a Caucasian boy, yeah, yeah. and um, and I think I was in the toilet, you know, peeing at the trough, and he was there, and and he was making fun of me or something like that, mm. and I guess me being that sort of impatient kind of kid yeah i pushed him into the trough right because i was like you know if you, you you're making fun of me you want to fight like boom smash him into the trough i love that right and um i'm sorry if, if you ever hear this jason uh, I'm, i don't know if you remember it but you deserved I, it i, for I still teasing you. I, I still remember it um <laughs> and obviously he cried because you know he was, he's a kid yeah and but he's also you know stinky now and and I'm sorry, like I actually, I feel bad because like- I'm know, sorry, I find it funny. <laughs> it's, well, like it's, it's not a nice thing to do, right? I, no, no, it's not. So- uh, Sorry, kids, no, don't push this, each other into but, the troughs. But this is, I, I can therefore see why it's very easy that, that people would view me as an asshole, right? Right, right. Because right. if you view that objectively, you'd say that Johnny kid is an asshole, right? Why mm. would you go and push another kid into the trough? So what if he called you a couple of names, right? Yeah, and I, yeah. I think, you know, I think about it this way now because obviously 
you know, like names aren't don't gonna aren't gonna do shit to me now. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm beyond that. Right. But like, um, at that age, you know, that was that was sort of my first experience with any sort of, I guess, racism or or uh, like yeah. that kind of, you know, that I'm different. Right. But aside from that, like one of my other, I had a really good mate. Um, so one of my best mates in in, in primary school. Um, he was a Filipino guy as well, Filipino mm. boy, and and he had a he had a very that very strong <laughs> that Filipino uh, accent. Filipino accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was almost like more 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 that. Uh, American style, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's the Manila, the accent. Manila accent, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and and it was funny because like we st- we obviously were, were best mates back then, and um, he introduced me to a lot of um like hip hop music and stuff like because yeah. he was really into it then, and um, and you know, I I, I find that you know I, I'm the kind of I was the kind of kid that I I would sort of um, what's the word I I would mold to who I'm with, right? And so yep. because he had this sort of, you know, very strong kind of accent, like I started to pick up some of that Americanism <laughs> style accent. And then he would be like, why are you copying me? I'm like, I'm not copying you. Like, it's just. I think, I yeah. think as kids, like you, you are impressionable. Yeah, you, you, sh- you shape, right? And yeah, my accent has been shaped by many different accents yep. as well. Yep. Um, I just want to, I just want to like take it sidestep a little bit, talking about like narratives and, and stories, right? Yep. Um, when you told that story about you with, this Jason kid yeah. teasing you. Yeah. Like, yes, one view of it could be that yeah. you were the asshole in this situation. Yeah. But then the moment that you started talking about racism, yeah. when he, if he's the racist person in yeah. the story, yeah. you're not, you're less of an asshole now. Yeah. Like for me, the, yeah. the story, the narrative of the story changed. changed. Like, yeah. He was giving you shit. If yeah. he was being racist, then yeah, he deserved to be pushed into it. Yeah. You know? Um, sorry, that was just a little th- the thought yeah. that came to my head. Yeah, well, I don't. And to be honest, I I don't even re- really remember what he was saying to me. He probably called me a chink or something like that, and and mm. that's that's just what what happened, right? Like, I, yeah, you know. Um, and but the the funny thing is, is right. Like, I, I I'm not afraid of confrontation, um, in that regard, and I don't <laughs> think I've ever been afraid of confrontation. But I um I was saying this to my wife because my son um he's a bit of a crybaby, um mm. and. But part of the reason why he's a, a crybaby is because it's it's an easy way out for him to get what he wants. Yep. Right. Because when I think back on myself as a kid, you know, probably that that sub sort of five years of age, um, sort of age group, then um, I was very much a crybaby. Right. Mm. So much so that my parents um, got me enrolled in karate because they thought you know it'll make me tougher and blah blah blah, yeah. blah. and you know. I, I, and I think back to times when, you know, like I wasn't really hurting or anything like that, but I'd cry just to get out of the situation and move on to something else. Like, you know. Path of least resistance. Yeah, path really. of least resistance, right? Like yeah. I found, it's like almost like you find a cheat code, right? You find <laughs> yeah. this cheat code that, you you know, you got a few crocodile tears and boom, you know, you get what you want. Yep. Right? And so, yeah, like that's that's just, you know, I guess what I, um, when I think back, you know, on some of those things, it, it, I, I really reflect on that. Um, from that perspective, mm. right? Like when you were in primary school, like what, what kind of a kid were you? I was, I'm trying to remember. I was the, I, I, I really loved to learn. Yep. When I was, when I was in primary school, I really loved it. Mm. So I would, every little bit of trivia, I would, I would like snap it up and I'd want to learn about everything. I just, I think at a, at, a, at a point in my life, I wanted to be a paleontologist or I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be something where I was discovering something every single day. Yep. Um, like learning something new. Like if I dig a hole and I find a dinosaur, like that's amazing. That's discovery. That's yep. the, yep. that was me as a, as a primary school kid. Yep. Um, and I think as I grew older, um, like I think, I think it was a little uncool to be smart or to, to be nerdy. Yep. And so I think that got beaten out of me. Yep. No pun intended. Yeah. But like, yeah. Like that, that was. But the, did you actually get, get bullied? Not, a bit no, no. I, I did get bullied, but I wasn't ever, but it was never beaten up. Okay. It was more like the, like the yeah, emotional, the verbal, yeah, the verbal, yeah. verbal bullying. bullying, um, which still, which actually does just as much damage. Yeah. Right. I think, I think it would be better if I was beaten up. Yep. Like, because you heal from that and you learn from that. But then the things that, happen on a emotional level don't actually come to the surface until like much much later, later in life yeah um 
But anyway, like, yeah, I, as a primary school kid, I loved learning. I loved, I was, I feel like I was in the library a lot. Yep. Um, and yeah, every time I was out in the, like the sporting field, there were, mu- there were kids who were much better than me at that, that, that stuff. Yep. And they would give me shit that I wasn't good. Like we'd play handball or something. Yep. Um, and like, if I made a mistake, they'd be like, oh, you're shit. I'm just yep. going to get away. Like, I don't want to be in you. Like if I was playing basketball, they didn't want me to be in the team because yep. I wasn't very good. Yep. Um, and so that took me away from the sporting stuff and I was the nerdy kid. Yep. Um, but moving into high school, I was wanted to reinvent myself. Yep. I wanted to be the, I don't know, maybe the cool kid in quotation marks. Yep. Um, and so I had contact lenses. I wasn't like wearing glasses, glasses anymore. anymore. Yep. Um, I was trying to go to the gym. Yep. You know, I started, I think I started going to the gym at like age 15. Yep. Um, which probably contributed contributed to stunting my growth a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and it was it was me trying to change myself into something different. different yeah, you know, um, and I think that that influenced my teenage years and into university. Yep, and I was trying to be something instead of just um, just being. Yeah, you're being a, a version of you. You wanted yeah. to be a specific version of yourself. Yeah, I yeah. wanted to be this like, I don't know. I can't I can't think of a better analogy for it than like the cool guy. Yeah, or whatever that was, because I didn't have a specific idea of what it was. Yep. I just wanted to be different. I yep. just wanted to be not the. So would you say then? Kid. Would you say then that you know your your time in primary school wasn't happy? Like you didn't enjoy primary school from that perspective, just because of you know that. Um, I think there were moments in moments in primary school that I didn't enjoy. Yep. Um, but and because I didn't have the emotional intelligence back then mm. to understand what those things meant. Mm. And I think um if there are kids listening to your podcast, mm. the moment that someone bullies you is not a reflection of you, it's a reflection of them. Yeah. That they have there's a problem inherent in them that they're trying to Yeah, they're they're put, they're putting lash it on out. To, yeah, yeah. They're putting it on to someone else. Yeah. Right. Um and I didn't know that. Yeah. From a young age, so I thought when someone was like, "Oh, you're you're shit at this," I, that was just it. That was the fact that I was like, "I'm bad at this. I'm yeah. bad at um, sport or, or whatever." It felt like I couldn't learn to be better yeah. at it because they had already said, "Yeah, you're bad." Yeah. Um, when you see when you talk about like going back to what you're saying about narratives, right? You know, people only sort of um, look at the good stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and and they, they when they when you're comparing yourself against somebody else. You only compare yourself. You're, you're comparing the worst of you against the best of someone else. Yeah. Right. And people don't really take into account the full story, right? Mm. Like, so as an example, if I talk about my mate um, who, who passed away last year, the guy was fucking a great genius. Like, Are you able to say his name? Yeah, Adrian. Adrian Wu. Yeah. yeah. Um, ninety nine point nine five in the HSC. You know, like world class brain. Amazing. You know, like is one percent from 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 a mental standpoint right right and you can go like this guy you know gone to actuary could have done so many different things mm. um but he had his own demons right yeah so you know if you were to compare yourself um against him you know in high school and think oh you know you want his life you don't know what he's going through yeah absolutely you don't know what sort of things are there under the surface that that he might have gone through or had been going through mm. um and you know we, we 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 all sort of you know gleam on this social media stuff and then we go oh you know we want to be this or want to be that and that's why people are struggling so hard to invent themselves into this different version of them yeah when all they need to do is really just focus on trying to be the best person that they can be yeah right like um the 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 concept i always i always love um, thinking about is that if each individual just focused on not being an asshole the world would be a much better place because Absolutely. there wouldn't be many as many assholes, yeah. right? Because you know, um, it's not a. I don't think it's a conscious thought for people because it's um, not many people are like. No, no, let me reset that. I don't mean not many. I think a large proportion of people probably aren't as self aware as they think they are. Right. Right. We have this view that oh yeah, well I'm self aware and I'm aware of this or I'm aware of that. Um, yeah. But you know. To really be able to step back and go, mm, I probably did the wrong thing there, and to you know, to reassess, to reassess it, and, mm. and and potentially change your viewpoint on that. You know, um, I don't know how many people reflect on that nowadays. Mm. You know, and and then it bubbles up in other ways. You know, because 
the, the, the longer that you keep it sort of bubbling inside, it, it's going to force itself out in a different form. Yeah. Right. So I have this thing like, you know, um, one of, like, I wouldn't say it's a rule that I try and live by, but it's like when I have this thought in my head of someone, I'll, I want to ring them because there's a reason why I thought about them. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, it could be, they, they might, they perhaps they, they're not my friend anymore and they don't want to talk to me or whatever the case may be. Yep. But I've thought about them. So that's telling me something that, hey, I should try and reach out. And if anything, you know, even if they don't want to talk to me or whatever, if they see the call and they, they don't want to take it or whatever, that's fine. Um, but, you know, it's not from a, 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 a bad place that I'm trying to contact that person. It's, it's because, you know, I want to, I'd, I'd love to reconnect or yeah. see how they are, you know. Mm. Um, and so I, I always get these, you know, thoughts in my head sometimes when I'm driving or whatever that I think of someone. Mm -hmm. And then I view that always as a sign that, hey, I should pick up the phone and call that person. Yeah. Right. Um, and I was saying it like to, that. yeah, I, like I was in, in um, the, one of the last podcasts I did with Cassie, you know, she was talking about one of her high school friends, um, uh, Anne. And I said, and I, after we, you know, I put the podcast up, I did text, text Cassie and I said to her, you know, you should really contact your friend Anne because obviously it came to you for a reason. Mm. Um, you know, and like, and, and she was like, no, no, like, like, you know, like it wasn't anything bad. Like, you know, we just sort of lost contact because we all got busy with our own lives. And, I'm, yeah. and that's exactly the reason why I, when I have that sort of um, inclination that when I have that thought of someone, yeah. I'll call them. Right. Because a lot of the times nowadays, I think people only call people when they have, when they want something. And they need something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, if, if, if we can sort of just change that a little and, and have people actually just contact people just because, Hey, you know what, I just thought of you, you know, yeah. how are you? And, and hence, you know, when, when you popped up, then I was like, oh, let's, let's, let's reconnect. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because there's a reason why we've, we've, we, we've lost connection because we're doing other things and everybody's busy with life. Yeah. But it's great to be able to reconnect and have these sort of conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that was one of the things that I, I always look back on and I go, okay, so, you know, um, things may have happened. And sometimes it's hard, you know, you might, you might look at, you know, you think of someone, you go, oh, shit, I probably don't want to call them. Right, because maybe it didn't end up the right way, right? Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's like, okay, well, you know that that if I if I don't listen to that thought now, mm. um, I feel like those thoughts won't come as often. Yeah. Right, because you've ignored it. Right, mm. and so, and then that that ignoring that thought might mean that you miss out on some other kind of great opportunity down the line. Yeah. Because you didn't listen to your gut or your intuition to say, hey, touch base with this person. Yeah. That. I had a particular experience with that. So again, I was living in Singapore yeah. um, a couple of years ago and I felt like I'd lost touch with a bunch of my friends. Yeah. And one friend in particular, I won't say his name, um, but uh, when I came back to Sydney, I tried reaching out. Mm. I was like, hey, let's catch up. You know, like I'd, I'd really love to catch up because I'm back in Sydney. Um, we obviously didn't get a chance to, to, to see each other or catch up while, while I was in Singapore. So I really wanted to reconnect. Mm. Um, and he must have been busy at the time, um, but there was no reciprocation mm. of the like that invite. Let's, I'm like, hey, let me know when you're free. Let's just. I yep. kept messaging him, and there was nothing, and it made me really like. I was quite upset. I was, yep. I was, uh, I was ready to kind of just write that off as like write yep. that friendship off. Yeah, um, and something clicked in me, and I like just thinking about what you said, but I don't know what the other person is going through, right? Yeah, um, I found out later that he was going through some tough things right. yeah and and for whatever reason he didn't want to reach out to his friends yeah you know um or just to he, he was just yeah going through some stuff and i remember seeing him at a wedding right and i was like um i know you've been busy and i know that you know we haven't seen each other and yeah we were we were very 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 close like prior to me going to to singapore and i said look i'm always in your corner yeah so Regardless of if you message me or not, yeah, I'm I'm here. I'm in your corner. Yeah. So because we like we're good mates. mates. Yeah. Um. So that was really interesting that you that you said that like you know we don't necessarily know what other people are going through and yeah. just just reach out and just even if they don't say yeah. even if they don't reciprocate it back just like hey I'm yeah. thinking about you. Well, see, it's it's wrong of us to assume that just because we message someone that they have to reply to us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The, nobody has to do shit. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But. So, so it's like, it's almost like, you know, um, when you give a gift, right? Yeah. I, are you giving a gift because you're expecting something in like, return? Yeah. Right. Or are you really giving a gift for the sake of giving a gift? Yeah. Right. So if you view communication in the same light, 
right? Yeah. View it in the same light. So me wanting to touch base with you, that's that's a gift, whether you reciprocate or not. Mm. I've Because I put the energy there, the gift is gone, right? I don't expect anything back. Mm. You know, if, if we have the conversation, great. Um, because, you know, obviously it, it's great to be able to have that connection and, and that's what sort of keeps the world spinning. Um, and I think, you know, we, we can drive more meaning from that and that's hence why, you know, community is so important and yeah. friendships are so important, relationships are so important. Yeah. Um, but if not, like, that's cool. I'm, I'm not going to get cut up about it mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving that energy out and sending those positive vibes, not expecting those things in return. Like yeah. if I get them, fantastic, but I'm not asking for it, yeah. you know. Um, and then, you know, I think, you know, the, on the flip side though, you know, in business, you know, when you, if you, if you do that in business, like when you do need something in return, because people don't associate, you know, you, you calling with wanting something, mm. they're more than happy to take the call. Yeah. Right. If they, if they, if, if there's a relationship there, is there some rapport? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, we're going to get to, um, you going to Singapore, but we, st- we've still got a, a bit to go in terms of, um, so uni life, what was, what, what did you study at uni? I studied IT. IT? Yeah. So I wanted to, like, in high school, I loved music. Yep. I just, I think growing up, I loved music. So did you play any, <coughs> any instruments in high school? I played um, just barely. I was barely possible playing guitar. Okay. Um, and I sang. Yep. I still do. I and, still do okay, hang on. Let's, let's go back a step. So did you ever get any lessons? Um, I have, like, in, at an older age, I got guitar lessons. Yep. Um, but... The reason, and, and sorry, up. the reason why I say this is because I remember this was many, many years ago. But anyway, like there was one time when I was at Westwood's Parramatta with some of the guys, and you were there singing. And I think we went to see you <laughs> because he, he, you, like Don, was like busking in the shopping center, but he he was paid to be there to yeah. sing in the shopping center. Yeah, yeah. I was. Right. So the fact that you know if you hadn't, if majority of your learning was self taught, that's fucking amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks man thank you <laughs> yeah. well yeah from high school i i think yeah i just kind of learned from other people yep i didn't get any like, professional lessons yep it was kind of yeah self-taught this is prior to youtube and uh, being yep. tutorials online yep um and it was very much the i would be around friends who knew how to play guitar mm. and it was kind of like well, they would play something and i'd be like hey what, how do you play that chord or mm what's this? Like if I play this, what, what is that? Like what, and just asking questions and, and trying to um, incrementally learn how to play guitar mm. and, and also spend lots of long nights just with a guitar in my hands and trying different chords and trying different finger placements. And then like, what does this sound like? What does that sound like? What does this sound like? And um, that's how we learned mm. to play guitar. Yep. Um, singing. I got lessons at a young age. Yep. Um, because yeah, my, my parents, they were like, oh, you're a good singer. You should, you know, perform for your aunties and whatever. <laughs> and then eventually I was singing on stages and, and whatever. So, um, because my mom, um, is quite an overachiever. She wanted me to be like better at yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that was my, that was my music, my musical origins basically. Mm. And I loved music, still do um in high school and it was a it was a cross between um i remember there would be there was a decision i really wanted to do business studies as well um but ultimately it kind of won out okay of those three yep. things like um and I, I think during that time it was like you have a workload right mm. in high school mm. and you can you can choose to have more or less your yep. workload and some kids who are um, who are who are overachievers will have a bigger workload or whatever. Anyway, I I felt like I couldn't handle the workload that I had with business studies and IT and music that were my main things. Business studies lost out, mm. and so it was a, it was a competition between IT and music. Mm. And I remember having a conversation with my mom and saying, "I'd like to do music. I mm. would like to be an audio engineer." Um, because there's that technology side, which mm. I which I loved. I loved just like um, playing with technology and just learning about computers. Again, it's that discovery thing, right? Yep. Um, but the conversation, I remember having it with my mom. She's like, oh, no, you may not make enough money with that one. <laughs> right? You're like, <laughs> it was very much like I wasn't. She's like, oh, you should, uh, you, you should, 
you should do the IT. You maybe you make lots of money with that, you know. Um, and it was very much about, and I, and I get it. Like for my parents, it was about they, they want stability. St- stability, yep. exactly. All first, all, all first generation migrants. So when the, the parents that come first to the country, they all want their kids to be professionals of some sort because they want stability. Stability is yep. exactly the, yeah. That's their mindset. Um, it's not necessarily the um, mentality of of the like the two thousands mm. because everything is like a gig economy now. Yeah, there there are still companies that you know can offer you jobs that yep. are nine to five jobs, but um, I think more and more people are going into industries that give you like it's it's a gig thing, it's a contract thing. You're basically yep. contracting. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I decided to. I made the decision to go into IT, you know, in the first year of IT, I, I like didn't really enjoy it. Yep. And I don't know why it must've been, it must've been because the decision wasn't completely mine. Yep. You know, I yep. wanted to do audio engineering Yep. and I felt as if I was just wasting time. Yeah. And I was yep. just rolling with, I was rolling with it because my parents wanted me to do roll it. with it. Yep. Um, I deferred for a year after that first year and did a music like tech, technical production course yep. in TAFE. Um, and I got like a certification in it. Um, and then I think ultimately, because I was trying to juggle both. Mm. So um, then after the first year, you went back to uni? So the, after the deferral year, did you go back? Yeah, to, I went yep. back to uni. Yep. And I was like, maybe I should just finish. Yep. But then um, my heart wasn't in it. Yep. For IT. Mm. As I was kind of like faffing about for a yep. year. It wasn't, wasn't like remarkable. Mm. I didn't have remarkable um, results. Um, and I think it just got to a point where I, I was I was doing uni, but I was doing music stuff on the side. Yep. You know, and I, and I was, again, trying to juggle both of those things and wasn't trying to be amazing at both. Yep. And I think that's what that's what can tend to happen if you're, you've got two feet. If you've mm. got feet in different places. Yep. Um. And yeah, it got to a point where I was just like, okay, well, music stuff is kind of just happening, mm. and I might as well just finish this this um, IT course and and just be done with it. Yeah, you know, it took me it took me a little while to to finish it because I was so blasé about it. Mm. Um, yeah, and that was me through uni, being more into music and wanting to succeed more in music, but then doing something where I didn't really have my heart in it. Mm. Um. And now I feel like those two things are, those two things are still around. Like mm. I, I, I enjoy, so what I do now is I'm a business analyst. Yep. I work for, um, I, I work with a team for Google Chromebook. Mm-hmm. So they're like sales analysts, they're the data analysts yep. for, for them um, and selling their Chromebooks. And that stuff is really interesting to me. Yeah. Like I. That's I, very IT. Centric, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, like obviously, so there's a big dis. Okay, let me let me. We might as well go into this because there's a big disconnect between, you know, what you're taught at uni and what is actually practical yeah. in, in your working career. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I've talked about this before. You know that there's a lot of guys in in my industry that are markedly more successful than I am, mm. um, without any of the qualifications that I've got. Um, but it, I guess it's just different because my pathway to there was was the pathway that I went, and yeah. their pathway to there was was a different pathway. Yeah. Right. Um, did you? So you doing that that sort of um, sales analyst um, type of thing now? Is there like, are you grateful that you you went through uni and and done IT for that, or do you view uni as more like it was great from the friendships and the relationships that you developed? I think it's more for the learning. yeah from the from the friendships and relationships, but the the thing that I can attribute. Um, my like to my uni degree mm. is the the analysis side of it, like yep. the critical thinking critical side thinking. of it. Yep. Um, so I was I majored in systems analysis and design. Yep. And a lot of that is understanding how things work and how things um uh kind of flow and fit together. Yep. Um, and a, a lot of people ask me like, "Well, you're doing IT, or you're doing like an analysis and design, like systems <laughs> analysis. Um, how the hell does that work with music?" Yep. And I was I the way that I viewed it, the parallel between that was when you have a system, when you have like a team, when you have an, or any organization, there are yep. many moving parts. And for it to work efficiently, you have to like- Get them to sync. Get them to sync up. Yep. 
the same thing with music. Yeah. Like you've got a guitar, you've got a piano, you've got you've got drums. Yeah. They could be all playing different things, but so in order to make music, yeah, you have to make them in sync. You have to yep. make them on beat. Synergize. And, yeah, the, the same frequencies. Key. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those kinds of things. And um I think when I uh looked at it from that standpoint, I was like, this is this is why I enjoy this stuff. Yep. This is why I enjoy analysis and this is why I enjoy data. Yeah. Like when I got to when I got this job, um when I applied for it actually, they went through the I went through the first interview. Yeah. And that was just like a culture fit type interview. And yep. uh, I wanted to see who I was, what my personality was and how I approached different things, all of all, all of that type of culture questions. Mm. And then the second one was uh like a aptitude. Yep. So they're like here. They it gave is. me a they gave me a data set and they're like analyze this and present it to us. Yep. I had so much fun with it. Yep. It was it was ridiculous. Like I was like, oh, spreadsheets. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was I was like back in primary school again and I was discovering stuff. I'm like, what can I find yep. from this data? How can I analyze it a different way? How can I do this? And it's like, what can I learn from it? Like it's that discovery all over again. Yep. And um I was like, this is amazing. I've I've I found something that I I really enjoy that yep. you know, I, I'm I feel like I'm good at. Yep. Um and <laughs> Like I still do music on the side, or do you still do have? I still have creative projects. Yep. Um, but I think like now I'm I'm in a I'm in a role that I enjoy. Yeah. And is challenging, mm. but at the same time, like I think everything that I do now, I take it from a standpoint of learning. Yeah. You know, like what can I learn? What can I what can I discover? Yeah. Um. It's um. Uh, it's it's. One of the things that I always think about, um, so I had this really cool uh, engineering science teacher when I was at high school. Mm. Um, his name was, I think it was David O'Brien, Mr. O'Brien is what we used to call him and anyway. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a funny old, he's a funny old guy. And um, the thing that he would always say to our engineering um, science or engineering studies um, class was that um, all a bachelor's degree enables you to do is learn for yourself. Right. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, he, he, he what he stressed to us was that um, going to uni isn't the be all and end all, but the key takeaway you need to take away from a bachelor's degree is that you now have the ability to learn things for yourself, mm. right? And um, and that's that's one thing that I I definitely think is um, what I got out of uni. You know, understanding how to research information, uh, obtain information, critically analyze it to make a decision. Yeah. Right. Um, and of course, you know, experience goes into that as well. Cause the more that you get exposed to that in your working career, the, the better your decision making ability becomes. Mm. Right. And then um, the, like, you know, when we talk about, um, I guess, you know, spreadsheets and stuff, <laughs> um, I, 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 I'll share this story because I think it's, it's a very um, good example of it. Um, so I, I, I finished my uh, uni degrees and um, my apprenticeship um, cause I was working as a apprentice mechanic. Mm -hmm. at a Toyota dealership and um, the the boss there got me uh, an opportunity to go to Toyota head office yep. right so this sort of leads up to how I got the FJ um, <laughs> so so basically in my first interview um, I got thrown uh, a, an Excel problem yeah. right and they said you know okay so um, you know this role that we're, we're giving you is going to be a lot of analysis so we just want to do an assessment of your Excel skills Right, right, and it, it's it's funny now because if any of my you know my current or well, people that have worked with me you know over over recent years like they they view my Excel skills as pretty up there, right? right. Like uh, my my team and my dealership, I've got managers there. Go, I, I don't even understand what you just did, right? Because I I, I, ha I know all the old shortcuts <laughs> yep. from old Excel days, and um, I'll go into how I sort of picked up on that. But so this first interview, they threw me basically this data set, and then. Basically, the question was saying, you know, they want to know how many of this particular things are in the sheet. So it was a VLOOKUP, right? Yep. So any Excel nerds would know what a, a VLOOKUP is. Basically, <laughs> looks up a vertical array and, you know, based on what's in column one, you know, you might draw what's in column five or six or seven, you yep. know, the res respective value. And anyway, so when I got this task, I nev I'd never done a VLOOKUP before, right? And so me being, you know, the, I guess impatient sort of go-getter that I was. Yep. I I mentally went through and <laughs> went through the a thousand numbers, <laughs> came to the correct answer within this within the requisite time frame. Yeah. Um and 
basically, you know, when the, when the guy came back in from the, the interviewer came back in, Chris O'Connell was his name. Um, so um, he was he was my ma- my direct manager at that point in time, or who I was gonna who was gonna become my direct manager. Yeah. And um, Chris came back in and he, and he and he sort of looked at what I did and he goes, "Oh, you got the right answer." Um, how, how, um, but how did you how did you get that? Because he, he was looking at my cell. There was no formula, right? It was just the answer, right? And and I and I said, oh yeah, well I just you know I, I went through all the data and I just pulled out the answers. And and, and, he's, and he and he sort of looked at me and he's like, oh, okay. Well, what what we're actually looking for is for you to have done a V lookup. And I'm like, what's a V lookup? <laughs> <laughs> and and so then he's like explaining to me what a V lookup is. Anyway, so that so that was my first interview, and I was like, <laughs> "Fuck, I just failed this interview, right?" Like, yeah. you know, my boss has given me this opportunity to get it, got my foot in the door at, at, at Turner Motor Corporation, and here I was, you know, went through the first interview, and I couldn't even do a V lookup. Fuck, what an idiot am I, right? Like, yeah, yeah. and I was thinking, "Oh shit," right? And so I think that was on like a that was like on a Wednesday, and then two days later on the on the Friday, uh, sorry, no, that was on a Monday. Yep. And then two days later on the Wednesday, I got a phone call saying we want to do a second interview with you, mm. uh, and that was on a Friday. And um, obviously, you know, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know because I had the right connections. And then I did the second interview on a, on a Friday, and then on Friday afternoon, um, my actual dealership boss, Marcus Gerald, rang me to say I got the job before Toyota had even rang me to say I got the job, <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> so, um, and, you know, that started off my, my, my career at Toyota. But I guess, you know, Talking about, you know, that, that bachelor's degree being that, you know, teaches you how to learn things for yourself. I was then thrust into an analyst role in Toyota. And um, you had to learn what a VLOOKUP was. Had to, I had to learn Excel, like, to, to the nth degree, yeah. right? And, and I, I got to credit um, one of my mates, Phil Sue, um, who was also um, an analyst um, who became, you know, really good friends with me because, you know, he, he, was, a, he, he was a guy that he studied IT or computer computer um, science or whatever at uni. Yeah. So that was his field, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and here I came and like, you know, basically zero practical Excel experience. <laughs> and, um, you know, I started like, I, I got myself to the point where Phil and I were, were, were almost on the same level. Like, you know, I, I, I absorbed his knowledge mm. and then we're starting to build macros and all these sorts of things. And then, you know, we, we kept looking for ways to sort of outdo each other. Right, and that's that's why my Excel skills got to to that that kind of a level. Yeah. Right, but it was just you know from from the start it was just horrible. Like when you fail a, a basic V lookup, you know, and like a lot of people may not know what a V lookup is, but when you realize how basic it is after you learn a bit of Excel, yeah, you go, wow. It's. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to bring up the point that like, um, going through thousand lines of data to find a particular answer. That is painful. That yeah. is very, very painful. And I like I want to commend you <laughs> on how long did they give you to do this? I think it was a 20 minute thing. 20, 20 minutes. Like yeah. 20 minutes to go through a thousand lines of yeah. data yeah. would be so painful to me. And, yeah. and like some of some of the people in my like my team, when they I, I want I want to teach them like these sorts of skills. Like we use Google Sheets, but yep. similar but different. Yeah. I use Google a little Sheets bit. too, yeah. And um like trying to find those particular like find trying to find an answer in a in a data set. Um, some of them will count things yep. manually. Yep. And I'm just like, don't do that. Just yep. <laughs> and they're like, okay, can can you show me like a simple way of doing it? And I'm like, okay, cool. Do this count formula. Ifs. Count ifs, yeah. Yep. Those some ifs. And they're like, <laughs> do it in five seconds or yeah. something, right? Yeah. Um, man. So I commend you on doing that in 20 minutes yeah. without losing your mind. Yeah. Well, it, that that's that drive to to succeed. Succeed at all costs. Like, yeah. you know, um, not you know, trying to let any opportunity go. I love it. Kind of a thing. I absolutely love that. Right. And, and, and I think at the same time, like, um, it's an interesting thing that you talk about university and being like, uh, the reason why we go to university is because we go there to learn how to think, yep. not to think in a particular way. Yeah. Um, and talking about first generation migrants and their view of things, stability was their mentality. Mm. Stability was their, their Bible basically. Mm. That if you do a certification, if you graduate from university, you get in a job and you're entry level in this job. And then the next level is maybe you're a junior and then maybe you're an yep. you're, you're, um, um, uh, advocate or whatever it is. And then you're in management. And then that was the pathway. That was the pathway for them. Mm. But then for us as second generation and, and everybody else in the like subsequent generations, it wasn't about a set pathway. Mm. It was about learning to adapt mm. 
and then changing and then succeeding in that direction. Yep. Um, and I think like talking about it from that, like we're, we're in this period where it's where everything changed mm. when, when COVID-19 hit. Mm. Right. And I think the businesses that were able to pivot quickly mm. and adapt around it, were able to kind of, kind of continue to su- succeed. Yep. And, and yes, some industries kind of fell off because uh, there's a, like a physical element or like a yeah. face-to-face element. Yeah, gyms. Yeah, those kinds of arts places. Yeah. Yeah. Those kinds of things. But even then, like my um, Krav Maga school, mm. they've been doing online classes or yep. they've been, you know, in, trying to teach their students um, via Zoom, mm. for instance. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really cool. And it's really cool to kind of see it now for what it is in hindsight that it isn't a set path for us. Mm. It's never going to be a set path for us from this point forward. Yep. Um, that all it is is like, okay, let's move in a particular direction, make a decision, and then deal with what happens then. Mm. And if things change from there, we have to make another decision and then move in that direction. Mm. It's it's not about like, if I continue to do this same thing, if I continue to press this one button yep. for years, eventually I'll get good. Mm. Or like, eventually I get to a particular... Um, status in this company, right? Mm. It's never, it's never really about that anymore. Yep. It's about being like, okay, what can I learn from this role? Yeah, and then how can you apply that? It's the translation of skills now. Yes, yeah. exactly. I, I always talk about it as well. Like, I think that's that's probably m- one of my strengths is that you know, I I, I view all, I don't view any of my learning as wasted. Mm. You know, even even the times that I I've learned the wrong things, it's not it's not wasted. It's it's experience. Absolutely. You know? Um, and when you when you're younger, you don't you don't truly understand what experience is until you you go through you it go from, you've gone through it yeah right and you've had those experiences and then they, they they change your perspective and shape you know your direction yeah um you know when 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 you're talking about you know um covid you know um and also you know our parents mentality about that stability what, what i was just thinking about is how you know when we when we think of the word privilege mm. right I think people sometimes lose sight of just how privileged we are to be in a first world country in Australia or, yeah. you know, in Sydney, it, no matter what part of Sydney, right? Yeah. yeah. Like there's, there's, there's better areas and there's worse areas, but the fact that we're not, you know, we're in a, we're in such a, a stable country Yeah. from that perspective. Such a supportive country as well. And yeah. Like that's, that's privilege to begin with. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, I think people sometimes lose sight of that. Mm. And like privilege really is, I, I would say privilege is like a, a step, right? Yeah. And you can either choose to use it as a step and step up from it mm-hmm. or you don't and you go nowhere, right? Yeah, it'll just you, be you, your... You, squ- you squander the opportunity. That's just, yeah, yeah. Right? You're up there so, and still, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we're, we're so lucky to be in, in a country where, you know, we're like most of our basic requirements are essentially met. Yeah, healthcare is like right? taken the care of. The simple fact that... that like I guess the, you know, in in the current work workplace, the gig economy and all that does exist. Yep, that's a privilege in itself. Yeah, right. We don't have to be um, factory workers if we want to look at you know doing certain skills yep. or um, you know we want to build a, a, a I guess a, a fan base on on by entertainment or education. Mm. You know, you, you, we have those avenues. We're privileged to have those avenues. We're privileged to have the internet to be able to do these other things. Yeah, right. we and our parents weren't. Yeah. Right. It did, they didn't have that platform. Mm. So, you know, um, I think you know ultimately, like, yeah, like the we we do need to acknowledge, um, at all times that you know the only reasons why we're allowed we're capable of doing the things and achieving the things that we're capable of is because we're stepping on the shoulders of our parents. Absolutely. You know, um, the fact that they brought us here to this country to then establish a lives for ourselves like that's yeah. privilege. They gave us the opportunity to That's, come here. Yeah. And, and you know, just by sheer luck, right, you just happen to be your parents' child, mm. right? Where, yeah. Whereas you could be, there's another child, and, I, like, I'll talk about this concept because I, um, it, was, it, it was something that popped up on, on the Joe Rogan con- uh, um, podcast, podcast yeah. um, where they're talking about how big the concept of infinity was. Right? Yes. Yeah. And infinity is, is so large that um, there – there would be another universe where there'd be a, a Don and a, and a Johnny having this exact same conversation. Yep. There'd be another universe where I would be Don and you would be Johnny, mm-hmm. right? Mm. And 
I, 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 I keep thinking about it because I, you know, sometimes, <laughs> and, and look, we all have bad thoughts, right? Right. Right. So I try and use this to be a better person, right? So when I have this really bad thought, like, you know, um, this person's really ticked me off and I want to hurt this person, or mm. just like a, like even like a criminal thought, right? Then I think, <laughs> I, I think to myself. Pushing them into a trough. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, uh, then I think, you know, well, there's probably some version of the universe where I am that person. So I don't need to be that person in this one, right? Nice, okay. Right? So there'd be mm. some version, so, you know, like the, like somebody's ups, uh, done the wrong thing by me and there's probably some version in, in some version in, in out there in this infinite universe where, I've, where I haven't been the bigger person and I've, where I've killed that person or done, you know. You've hurt them, hurt them in some way. Done yeah. some sort of irreparable harm to them, right? There'd mm. be some version out there, right? Mm. Because for every fucked up thing that does exist in, in this world, there'd be some version in the concept of infinity of just how large it is mm. where you would be doing that to someone else. Yeah. Right. So I, I look at that as an opportunity to then make sure that in this universe where I'm conscious mm. to try and be that little bit better and try and be that slightly bigger person. I, li- I like that concept because um, it ties in very well with that um, idea of like iterative change, mm. right? learning from your experiences mm. and what you've been able to do. What it sounds like is you're able to tap into the possibility or learning from the possibility, yeah. not actually learning from um, like we learn from experiences and learn from like, you know, what we experience, but you, what you're talking about is um, understanding the possibility of an experience yep. and then learning from that. Yeah. It's like, oh, if I make this decision, then I could be this person. Mm. And instead of being that person, you're like, well, I don't want to be that person. Yeah. That's, I don't have to succumb to be that yeah. person. Like, I, yeah. could, I could be the better, I'm trying to be the better version of myself. Yeah, absolutely. There's no, there's no best. There's only better. Yeah. Right. And so, like, yeah. I, and I think you know, it, it's a very easy concept to to utilize if if you can believe that there are people that will influence your life. Like, mm. say, let's say between friends, family, teachers, you know, people that you've learned to do the right things from, instructors, you know, people that you've learned to do the wrong things on from, like failed relationships, mm. right? Um, if those things can um, influence us and change our lives and, and and make us better versions of ourselves, well, why can't we do that through considering other, you know, the, the possibilities. possibilities, yeah, right. So when, when you start to think about it like that, then I think, yeah, definitely you can you can use that to to keep trying to make yourself that little bit better. I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll maybe I'll start doing that yeah, as well. The, the infinite universe <laughs> theorem. I don't know. Um, okay, so after uni, yeah, then what what did you what did you do? I started working for a software development company for about eight years. Oh wow. Um, okay. So and what kind of software? Um, analytics. Okay. So, um, business analytics and um, data analytics. It was a company called SAS. Mm-hmm. So they're they're. I don't know if they've gone public, but they're a privately owned um, American company. Yep. Um, started off in software design. Now they provide, um, like the analytics software for some of the biggest companies yep. around the world. Okay. Anyway, I was one of their um, business analysts there, mm-hmm. and um, I was kind of taking care of their, their internal business systems and, and all of that stuff. I was there for eight years and um, I enjoyed it in some parts and other times it's like, I think if, if, you, if you're anywhere for longer than it's like three years or something, mm. you, you, it, can t- it can tend to get boring. Mm. Um, and I think the average, I remember when I, when I started in, in the workforce, um, I think it was said that like on average people tend to change their Mm. their roles or the professions every three years mm. but i was there for eight yep and i guess i had, at that point i was like by i bought into that whole idea of stability yep you know it was like i have this job i can just be in this job for like whenever yeah and and i can just kind of cruise and i had um there was a manager there who had been there since the inception of the company yep like he was a programmer mm um, and he'd been there for, I don't know, like years for years, yeah, maybe like 20, 30 years or something. Yeah. Um, so I thought like, yeah, maybe I could be in this job forever mm. and just not necessarily grow from it. Mm. And I didn't see that much growth in it yep. except being like the manager of whatever team I was in at the yep. time. Yep. Um, and yeah, I think 
it, it came to the point where um and there, there were times when when i kind of just like i was just in a, a lull right i was kind of like work is work yep. and i'll just do my bare minimum yep. and then on the side i was trying to do the other things stuff. like music stuff i was yep. trying to manage artists um trying to do events do, do do other things right um and i think it got to a point where when i got the opportunity to step out of that role yep. that job and travel to singapore mm. i took it up i was like i'm doing this okay well before we get to the singapore thing so let's let's talk about about uh that that sort of music side of it and um so how did you then get into trying to manage artists and so you were you, you were writing music yourself yeah yep. yeah i was writing music and i was um like trying to produce i wasn't i i wasn't the greatest producer i don't think i'm the greatest producer now <laughs> but um just wanted to create art yep. myself yep. um and obviously being around people music, musicians who are more adept than I, I i kind of wanted to aspire to be more like that mm. and be in that scene mm. um and when i was producing um briefly for a brief period of time i had a friend of mine who was kind of like a mentor mm. um like I think I was. I wanted. I wanted him to be my mentor, but he. I think he was busy with his own projects and so not necessarily. Um, shout outs to, to Zen, to Zen Lu, um, who was giving me lots of pointers when I was trying to produce and, and things like that. And one of the things he said was like, like "Don't quit your job. Like, yeah, you've got it's a side hustle. Keep, yeah, it's keep. a side hustle. Do that." Um, so thank you to to Zen for um, trying that. But I also wanted to. Uh, I remember I wanted to take a long like a month leave or like extended period leave mm. and i wanted to see if i in that time i could build something yep make music and do whatever and within that time that i took some leave i think this is later on in my in my career yep i didn't achieve much yep right i think i had gotten so used to doing the same thing every day yep it was um, complacency it was complacency yeah absolutely and I wasn't as hungry as I was when, like, I was working. Mm. Like, I, I would, there would be times when I would work till, like, five or six, like, nine to five. And then I'd go home and from, like, six to midnight or even later, I would be producing or I'd be, like, making music. Yep. And then go back to work and do it all over again. Yep. Or um, I'd go to an open mic night or, like, a jam night in the city which usually started at about 9 p.m., mm. mm. went until like 3 a.m. Yep. And then I wouldn't go home. I'd just drive to, to work, work. Yeah. and sleep in the parking lot, yeah. wake up, I'd like... Go again. And then go again and do, do the whole thing again. And so I was doing that. And I that was motivating for me. That was like, this is this is crazy. Like, I, yep. not sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> just want to put it out there. That's not sustainable. But I was more motivated to do that stuff then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking why and I, I don't know I think it was more because you got a structure yeah you know um, I oh, always yeah. yeah I think when you got that structure it, like it's hard that self discipline is, is such a hard thing to control um, and this goes back to you know one of my other favorite sayings is how you do anything is how you do everything you know mm. um, so when I find that you know when I'm on point at work I'm on point with everything mm. you know when I say on point at work I'm 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 present when I'm at home because I've worked so hard at work. Now I'm going to go home and spend time with my family. Still in the same I'm, mindset. I'm still in the mind, same mindset. Then I go to when I go do martial arts. I'm on point there yeah. because you know I, my my brain is in that gear. You're engaged, right? yeah. And so like in, and so I I can't even talk about this because you know when we hit this sort of quarantine quarantining sort of period, mm -hmm. you know, um, my work went through a, a tough patch, especially you know that mid March when the restrictions started to come through. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we weren't technically locked down, but we were, you know, like, so as when I say that, like, you know, there was no directive to say shut the business. Yeah. Right. Yet we're expected to turn up to work, achieve the same targets, um, sell, or sell, sell the same amount of cars, service the same amount of cars mm -hmm. throughout this period to try and keep the doors open and keep people employed and paid. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I had four very, very tough weeks there of trying to come to work, stay positive for my team, you know, um, keep them motivated mm -hmm. when you could see the motivation was, was, was difficult. Yeah. Right. And then at the same time, you know, I don't get to go to martial arts anymore. Right. Because that's, 
you know, all being canned. Like they all had to shut kind of a thing, right? And then so I, 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 I did a silly thing where, you know, I have a very addictive personality, right? So um, typically I channel those addictions into martial arts and that kind of stuff. Um, but then, you know, I thought, oh, well, you know, here we go. I'll, I'll start watching a Chinese drama, right? And I thought, I thought, oh, it's 30 episodes, you know, each episode's 40 minutes. Okay, well, you know, that'll get me through this, this sort of period, right? <laughs> then, then I started binge watching and then I realised it was 60 episodes, not 30. Oh, no. and, um, and, and so basically my four weeks was spent doing that, yeah. right? And as a result of that, I, I probably wasn't as present as I should have been with, with the kids and family. Yeah. I probably wasn't as present at work because, you know, during my lunch break, I'd, I'd watch an episode as opposed to trying to think about, you know, how I can keep, keep things going the way that they're going, yeah. right? And then, um, you know, it was funny, like, um, so my wife has a very different personality to me where when she watches a show, when it comes to the end, she feels sad because it's like, it's almost like you've spent all this time with these people yeah. Even though they're, they're characters in a show. And you're saying bye. You're saying goodbye. Yeah. Right? And then she's like, you have no heart. And I'm like, why? And she's like, you're glad that it's over because you can have your life back. Right? <laughs> and then I'm like, well, yeah. Like, <laughs> I view it the same way as like having junk food in the house. If there's junk food in the house, I'm going to eat it all because then I'm not going to see it anymore. And then I won't be tempted and I, I won't, I, I, you know. We're very similar, man. It's, you and I are very it's, similar. It's, it's all in, right? There's no, there's no, there's no in between. It's either I'm going to eat all the junk food and so there's no junk food and then nobody mm. can have junk food and then we're all good, right? <laughs> you could also just throw it out. Like, I mean. <laughs> no, well, I'm not going to waste it. I know, I know. Right? Yeah. So, because uh, I'm not going to waste it. Like, you know, I'm the kind of guy, if I'm going to open a, like a big packet of Doritos, I'm going to eat the whole fucking packet. You commit. I commit. You commit. Right? And then I can feel like shit for that period of time and then i'm going to go back to the way that I, things should be i like that i like right? that a lot so it, it look and, and please you know like for all you listeners out there it doesn't always go well so i can give you this example from when i was a kid um but i managed to talk my parents into buying me a bag of skittles um <laughs> if you finish an entire i think it was maybe a two or three hundred gram bag of skittles by yourself you are guaranteed to get sick right when i say sick not just like a sugar high and then sick um, I think it's been actually been shown that sugar has a causes like a high rate of inflammation. So yeah. your body can, uh, so any sort of viruses that might be out there, like COVID-19 or the flu or colds. Exacerbates or whatever, it. Yeah. Like you, you, it makes you prone to falling ill. Mm. Right. So like I, I can, I clearly remember, and this is the thing that turned me off Skittles from there. Like <laughs> was that I remember this one time and I, I, I only worked it out later on in life that my parents, you know, I conned my parents into buying me a bag of Skittles. I finished the whole bag and then I was sick. Like I, I had a cold or a flu for like two weeks after that. And I just think that the sugar had worn, because I had so much sugar in one hit, it worn me down so much yeah. that I just carped it almost. Far out, man. Yeah. But yeah, well, so got very intense there. <laughs> but, but let's go back a bit. Let's go back to um, <laughs> this, this music thing. and, and um, I just so, want, Yeah, yeah. Before, before we go continue <laughs> on, but I just want to say like you and I are very similar. Yeah. Like in, in terms of like wanting to succeed and wanting to like being so frustrated that we have to just, just brute force it. Yeah. You know, like there's been times when I, like I couldn't figure out something and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to brute force this yeah. and then make myself to succeed. And the whole sugar thing as well, I also have an addictive personality. Yeah. Um, to the point where I have very little sugar now. Yeah. Like when I do, I crash. Yeah. I think it's like maybe, I think it's called hyperglycemia. Glycemia, yep. Where you go into like really, really bad fatigue yep i think i had a japanese cheesecake last night and then i passed out yeah because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your body your body adapts right it, yeah. it gets used to not having the sugar yeah and it'll convert what little sugar you have into into energy or be you know if you're keto on, are you on keto or you do anything like that or no like i i, I just don't, don't have, have sugar, sugar yeah. all that much like there'll be sugar in your food but it just won't be added sugar yeah right? absolutely like from that perspective yeah so right. something like a cheesecake or like a bag of skittles yeah i would like just wouldn't have it <laughs> just out and yeah. i'll yeah pass out but yeah man I, I find that i find that entertaining that you and i are very similar yeah. sorry but yeah so on. um so then how did when when you like how did you get into that where you, you're becoming like this manager producer type guy for for these musicians um i think part of it was like i wanted i've always wanted to give more opportunity to more or more opportunity to other people yep and I think this comes from being the responsible one in mm. my family, mm. right? I wanted to be able to take care of other people. Um, I, I saw things 
from an overview. Like I was, I had this broad perspective of things. I could see everything, and I could, I, I could tell when, like, um, I needed to do something for my brothers. Like, if they needed food, I'd be like, okay, I understand when they need food. I understand, mm. like, what could be dangerous. I could, I, I had this understanding of how things work, mm. um, or broad understanding. Anyway, when I was working and and being around lots of people, I realized that some of the artists that I'd worked with or that I'd I've been around some of my friends, they needed guidance on how to be an artist in the industry. Mm. And I wanted to translate some of the things that I learned from musicians in the industry, mm. right? So there there are varying degrees of musicians mm. in the industry. And I think some of them, like you could be a writer, you could be a producer, you could be a session musician, a mm. musician. And I had lots of friends who were, were session musicians, but also performers. Yep. Um, and being around them, understanding that that was where the, the like the bread and butter was yep. of the music industry, mm. right? Because you have someone who's like Justin Bieber, who's the pop star, mm. who probably does write some of his stuff mm. and probably can play an instrument, which is great. Yep. But he also has a team of people behind him. Mm. He has a team, not maybe not just one, but like a team of producers. He has a team of songwriters. Yeah. He has a team like of stylists. He yep. has a team of dancers or like that. It makes, it takes a village to be a pop star. Yep. Right. It's you're, you're just the marketable face of the, of the brand of the business. Yeah. Anyway, um, I wanted to help, um, artists be the best that they can be in the industry. Mm. And so the people that I was with, so, um, Tim Bautista and Christian Joseph, um, those guys were um, fairly new, and they they were like they'd been performing, and they'd been writing, writing, and they're amazingly talented mm. guys, right? Um, they've released music recently, and um, yeah, I'm so proud of them. The, 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 the stuff that they put out is is, is great. Yeah, I what did I want what I wanted to do was build a platform for them to to do better, to be better, to 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 learn and continue to grow. Yep. in what they love doing. Mm. Um, and I think also prior to that, um, I was working with a friend of mine on an event mm. called Soul Good. Mm. And it was a the way that I en- I had envisioned it. And I feel, I feel like this is a little naive of me at the time because I was playing guitar and I was, I was singing um, and, and performing live in different places. But I wanted to give a platform to local artists yep. to be able to play their original music. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I think the reason why I say I was naive about it is because I didn't understand the business side. Yeah. I just wanted to create the, the creative side, right? I, yeah. I was writing my own songs. I wanted to play my own songs live. Yeah. And I wanted to do the same for other people. Um, but in order to do, make that into a business, you need to kind of have it marketable. Yeah. Now, like back then, so this is probably maybe 2005, 2006, mm-hmm. I think, when we'd started it, around about the time, early 2000s, what it was. Yeah. Original music on a local kind of grassroots level wasn't necessarily something that want, people wanted to pay to see. Yeah. Right. So, um, my friend, who um, all credit goes to John Ortiz, by the way, uh, who wanted to be the business side of, of that event, mm. um, wanted to help me with it. Um, built we built this event, and I think we he and I were both learning how to create an event, and I think he he had more experience, and I lent on him to to, to put it together to put it together. And yep. for me, I wanted to just be the creative side. Yep. Anyway, like uh, that lasted a little while, and eventually it turned into me just wanting to continue to give voices and giving platforms to to other artists and other people. Mm. Um, I guess you know, that leads on to the way that we operate the podcast, the Cheat Coders podcast now, yeah. yep. is giving, like, highlighting and showcasing local artists. Yeah. Um, so I've always wanted to be able to guide other people or help other people or help inspire other people mm. to be the best versions of themselves mm. as possible or help them to attain their goals. Yep. Um, that's how I got into the artist management. Obviously, that artist management... And all credit goes to like artist artist managers out there. Yeah, because that shit is tough. Yeah, you have to find um, first of all 
one, your your artist needs to be fairly marketable. Yeah. And at the time, um, like even now, like I think Tim and, and Christian still very marketable. Yep. Um, but at the same time, you also need to find work for them and you need to like find opportunities for them. Yep. Pardon me. And I think working a full-time job and trying to do that, the workload and the reward, mm. monetary reward wasn't there for mm. me. Yep. And it kind of, it was kind of just wearing me down a little bit. Yep. Um, so that kind of fizzled out. Yep. Eventually. Um, no bad blood between the boys and I. Yeah. It was just like, well, I, I, I can't continue to do this because it's taken up too much of my time. Yeah. And it's difficult. Yeah. Um but yeah, that was that was me trying to do more music stuff on the side while I was yep. working a full time job. Yeah. Yeah. So then okay. Uh, uh, where does Krav Maga fit into this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um I think and the stories, the, the stories kind of interweave. And um, I think I mentioned it earlier when I was 15, I like started going to the gym. Yeah. And, and you know how at school they'd have Thursday, Thursday sports yep. days or something, right? Yep. They made gym in quotation marks, one of the sports activities that you yep. do. Yeah. Cause I was like, cool, I, I'll sign up. I want, I want to be like, you know, strong or whatever. Mm. They, it was, they put 15 year old kids unsupervised in a gym uh, with gym equipment, yeah. which is stupid. Like yeah. now that I think about it, I'm yeah. like, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. You should at least have a personal trainer being there and be like, Hey guys, trying to develop them. Yeah. Yeah. This is how you, this is how, how you, you actually do it. Yeah. So I think for, for the first maybe few years in, until I was like 18, um, I remember being in the gym and using a particular like piece of equipment and some guy coming up to me, like one of the trainers and saying like, what are you doing? Like, that's how, yeah. how you use it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, cool, cool. Like, yeah, ego. Can, can you show me how to? Can you show me how to use it then? Like, yeah. Um, anyway, that I, I I started getting into um, uh, martial arts and stuff, and I'll, I'll take it back a little bit. Um, when I was younger as well, for whatever reason, I had a bad temper. Yep. I was an angry kid. Yeah. Like I'd punch walls and I'd like throw tantrums and yeah. And, and whatever. It might have been because and I'm trying to find a tenuous link, but like might have been because I was bullied. Yep. And I was just lashing frustrated, out. Frustrated. Yeah. yeah, frustrated. Um and say I was trying to learn something and like, you know, just and whatever. Um I it might have been because I was lashing out, right? And I had a really bad temper. And I was dating a girl at the time in high school. Um, I was never abusive to, to, to anyone physically. <laughs> I, sound, I, sound, I sound horrible saying that now. Yeah. Um, no, I was never abusive to, to anyone that I was dating, but I was kind of just, I would just uh, like throw tantrums. Yeah. Be very abrupt. Yeah. I'd be very yeah. abrupt, abrupt and like, yeah. uh, yeah, I was an angry kid. Yeah. And this girl that I was dating was like, you know, maybe instead of just like getting upset, getting upset, yeah. do something constructive. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's how I got into fitness. Okay. So I think from a young age as well, like my, my brother, um, Ken and my dad would piss me off. Yeah. And like, I love my brother and he has this innate ability to read people. Yeah. He's pushy, really pushy buttons. He, yeah, exactly. He knew, so how to push your buttons. he knew how to push my buttons, yeah. but I, I was trying to be positive. <laughs> yeah. Take a positive spin on it. He knows how to read people and he knows what makes people tick and he knows what annoys people. Right. And I think he learned that from being able to annoy me, yeah, and being able to annoy my dad, yeah. Um, so, I, like, needless to say, my my dad and I and my my brother and I used to bump heads. Yeah, right. We didn't get nec didn't necessarily get along. I then started using like exercise as my outlet, yeah, or using music as an outlet. Mm -hmm. But in this particular example, exercise exercise was an outlet, and I remember having an argument with my dad one time, mm. going into my room straight after yeah and then doing push-ups until i passed out <laughs> like, like <laughs> sorry um like yeah i did that and i was like I, I afterwards i felt too tired or i felt like you've already you've used up that energy yeah you've converted that energy into something else. yeah yeah and, and and turned that energy into something that was constructive yeah basically yeah um 
I started boxing. Yep. Um, and I started like training. I was I was boxing for five years, and I remember training for like hours. I used to be. I used to like finish work. I I, w- I would I would train in the morning for maybe half an hour to an hour, go to work, and then straight after work I'd be training in the gym for like three or four hours or something yep. stupid. Yep. Um, and yeah, I'd come home, and my brother would try to push my buttons again. Yep. And I'd be like too tired. I'd yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it ter- it turned into that, and I'd always been um, interested in. I loved I loved the mechanics of the body, like the anatomy. Yep. And that whole idea of um, the kinetic chain mm. when you throw a punch. Mm. Your 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 punch doesn't come from your fist. Your mm. punch comes from the ground up. Yep. Right? It's the balance. It's the like yep. the foundation. It's the twisting of your hips into yep. your shoulders. Rotation. Into, the exactly. Width. Yeah. To create the crack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, this could yeah. you do martial arts. So yep. the, that that's what I loved. Yeah. Like, when I when I discovered boxing as an outlet, I was like, this is amazing. Mm. Like I can, I, if my, if I move my foot just slightly, if I rotate it slightly yep. more to this direction, you generate more power, generate more power. Like, yep. you know, I can, I can get faster if I do this, I can do this. And then that turned on that, that um, whole idea of discovery again for me. I was mm. like, what can I learn from trying this? Or if I try this, um, so I was doing boxing for a little while. Um, and what I started to compete and I was probably a little late in, years to compete okay because i think i was um probably at the time early to mid 20s yep you know and there were there were kids who were yeah grew up doing pcyc and yeah yeah amateur yeah not necessarily like when you look at a guy like um francis Ngannou from the ufc Mm. who who like first time walking into a gym at 22 (laughs) now just an absolute fucking destroyer yeah, yeah, and and and, and, not, and yeah, I'm not saying that it's impossible to, yeah, to be able to do that. Yeah, it's more difficult. I it's like much, it. much, much, much yeah. more difficult. And again, I was um like working full time. Yeah, and I have a, I have a friend who who does this, or who I'm not sure if he still does this, but we'd go to work and then um train mm. afterwards, and like training was his life. Yeah, um, and he he tried to compete as well, but for me, I felt like that time to 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 train mm. and to to um, put in that effort to become semi amateur or am- amateur boxer yep. was just too much mm. if I wanted to do better in my career. Yep. Um, and I remember like boxing, I because I, I was shorter than a lot of the fighters. Mm. The reach. Yeah, the, I didn't have as much of the reach, so mm. my coach said maybe drop down to a well, lower yeah. weight class. Then you got a weight cut. Yep. Um, <laughs> I my like my. Comfortable weight is about 62, at the time, 62 to, to 65 kilos. Yeah. Right. Um, and my coach said, maybe get to under 60. Yeah. And because I was obsessed with numbers and like I was obsessed with that number. Yeah. I trained and I was like, like weighing myself every day. Yeah. Weighing myself as a, when I woke up, weighing myself before training, after training. Yeah. Just to be obsessed with that weight. And this is before like, um, because I was working, I couldn't have the time with my coach or yep. my conditioning coach yep. all the time. So um, when I weighed in for my first fight, I was like 58.3 kilos. Yeah. Right? So you're underweight. I was really underweight. Yeah. And my coach was like, well, what have you done? What have you done? What did you do? What did you do? Like you could have just gone to like 57, like, yeah. you know. And I was like, "Holy shit!" I didn't even realize yeah. what what had happened. Yeah, and there's differences in scales and all that sort of stuff that you don't think about. Yeah, and the the um the guy that I ended up fighting, he was like, it was in, I was still in the under sixty mm. card, but I think it's called lightweight, mm. right? Lightweight card. He must have been normal weight sixty five, mm. and like I was fighting, <laughs> I was fighting this guy and. Yep. It was just a total mismatch because I was I could have been in a, in a lower weight class in the flyweight or yep. whatever it was. Yeah. Um. Yeah. After that, I kind of got a little demoralized mm. about it all because I had spent all of this time mm. and effort into like wanting to to fight and wanting to compete, um, and didn't really achieve. And I think it was like I 
what I'd learned from that is like I didn't um, iteratively, iteratively, <laughs> I didn't iteratively focus on like what was the actual goal. Yep. My goal in my head was the weight, mm. right? I had the speed, I had the, the like the technique and all that stuff, but in my head I was like the weight needs to come down. Yep. Like I was so obsessed with that. Um, anyway, that was my that was my boxing career. Mm. I ended up becoming like um, second in that division, yep. the lightweight decision, the division in New South Wales or something. Okay, um, but yeah, that was, and then I started working full time at SAS. Yep, and I didn't have the time to go Went into it to, to to do it, and I started looking into other martial arts, mm. right? Because, um, and I don't know why, like, but Muay Thai enough didn't interests me mm. um i did capoeira mm. for a little bit yeah because uh, a friend of mine um and shout outs to leonard Mil- medel um who was starting to become an instructor in capoeira okay and so he's like hey come to come to my school like i'm starting school yep and, and come check it out yep ended up doing it for two years yeah right <laughs> <laughs> i got i got up to maybe an orange belt or or whatever i for I, i'm not sure if that means anything um, to anyone who doesn't know capoeira, but I'd been doing it for two, 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 maybe two and a half years. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And what I love <laughs> about capoeira is that there's this culture. Yeah, right. Like in boxing, you there was a culture in my, um, in in the camp that I was part of. Right. Yeah. Uh, it was like a, it was like a community, and, and and you you enjoy. I enjoyed that. Mm. When it came to capoeira, it was more like a family. Mm. Um, and I enjoyed it because. Like they teach you the music, they teach you the songs, you yeah. learn how to, the instruments and they give you the food and whatever. I know that my kicking ability probably got a little better yep. from Capoeira. Yep. Um, and I didn't have to worry about my weight yep. in Capoeira. Yep. Um, so I did that for a little while, but I didn't enjoy uh, the lack of instant gratification mm. for that sport, mm. right? Like I wanted to hit stuff. Yep. Like there wasn't an You outlet. don't get that immediate feedback. That's it. Like yep. instant gratification is the wrong word, but yeah, immediate yep. feedback. Yeah. When you punch when you're when you're doing boxing, you're punching a bag. Yeah. You feel the impact yep. immediately. It's feedback, yeah. It's feedback. And with Capoeira, it's you, it's a game. Yeah. yeah. You're swinging at air and yeah. You know, yeah. you're just trying to miss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There are times when you do make impact, but yeah. it's like you're playing, 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 boom. And then, then that's when you that's yeah. when you do the impact. And um there's a lot I feel like I've learned from Capoeira that that feeds into my fighting style, I guess, or the the way mm. that I um I, I fight now. Um, so I did that for a little while. Yeah, and then I was like, okay, I don't I don't get that immediate impact. Um, and I've always loved Batman. Yeah, <laughs> Batman's always been like I've always enjoyed that, and I remember playing. I think it was one of the Arkham games or something or. Or, or just reading something that Batman knows, Krav Maga. Like it was just this thing, and I, w- I wanted something more practical. Mm. And I know that it incorporates uh, elements of boxing, Muay Thai. Mm. Uh, it incorporates BJJ mm. wrestling, um, a whole bunch of things. Like, it encapsulates in it everything. Um, and I was like, "Cool, I want to try it." I looked up a school, yep, and started going. And because the school that I go to now, uh, which is, uh, if you go to Krav Maga, selfdefense.com, mm. um, shout out to Sven, um, who, who runs that school. They, they're amazing people, like really, really nurturing, really encouraging. Mm. And that's, that's what I like when you look for something in a, in a martial arts school, you yep. want something that's encouraging, but also challenging. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a bit of a culture. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, like I loved the practicality of it. Mm. Because it used, um, again, the the movements, the movements that you have, uh, um, that that kinetic chain, and also the way that um, your joints and arms lock. You like you can you can move you your elbows can only move a certain way, so you yep. can um, t- take advantage of that when you're like handling a person or whatever yep. like that. Um, and then yeah, I, I started doing that, and I was been doing Krav Maga for like five years now. Yep. And this year I am set to be getting a certification to instruct. Oh, wow. <laughs> Krav Maga. There you go. <laughs> yeah, man. 
<laughs> that's, so that's a really long-winded way of saying like that's what happens. That's how you're going to grab a gut. Yeah. So okay. So then, um, how, how how does this all tie into going going to Singapore? Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Singapore, I um, my girlfriend at the time she got an opportunity to work in Singapore. Yep. And um, she, we we were talking about it, and we'd, we'd been together for a while. Um. And she was like, you know, maybe maybe you can use this opportunity to to go back into doing music. Yeah. And so we traveled. We both traveled to Singapore. Um, and I like time boxed my. I was like, okay, let me let me do this music thing for a year. And so I tried to build an online production house mm. from Singapore. Yeah. And I like, you know, I traveled to places like Korea to to meet with other producers and yep. artists. And I had had connections in the Philippines. And again, also connections here in Sydney mm. to try to um, build this business. Yeah, and I think the dif- the difficult thing about building a business is like it, it, it is a it is a lot about who you know. Yeah, and so that first year, one year isn't necessarily enough if you don't have the connections in place already. Mm. Right. Um, so it was a bit of a struggle trying to trying to get this business off the ground from Singapore. Yeah, I, I know that I could have done it um, in Sydney. Yeah. Um, so that's what I did for for about a year, and then realized that, um, you know, obviously I need to like work again, yeah, because I didn't have I like I'd only set a year to do that, um, budgeted a year to to do that business, and then I started working for a startup company as a project manager, mm. then going back again into like that professional yeah, side, side, yep, um, all at the same time, like this happened at the same time as me starting my own podcast as well, okay. And then getting into um, the cheat coders. Yep. So I was working. There's a company called um, Xylem. Mm-hmm. So they do uh, logistics. So they were originally like the Uber for logistics, or like a Fiverr or Airtasker. Mm. Like you can go on the app initially. Go on the app. Uh, order somebody to deliver something for you. They pick it up from your place and deliver it to wherever you want to go. Mm. They pivoted. They pivoted in 2014 to be more of the B two B side instead yep. of B two C. Yep. And um, yeah, we're focusing more on the software. Mm. So that's that was my role there to to help guide their their app and mm. their software to to be bigger and better. Um, like long story short, Singapore was challenging and fun because. Completely different country, completely different culture. Yep. Um, but yeah, ultimately it was like, yeah, it wasn't necessarily the place to live for me. Mm. Um, so c- coming back from that, I was like, cool. What what have I learned from Singapore? What have I? Yeah. What have I um, achieved, and what can I like? Where can I take it from here? Yeah, yeah. And that's how I I think because I'd worked in a startup company, and I think the cool thing in Singapore is. Their government is very, very open to startup companies, yep. right? And they, they tax they, rates are good for business. It's, yeah, yeah. So and and they're they're because they're a fairly young nation, they are about growth, mm-hmm. right? So any any way for people to like create and innovate, they are open for that. Yeah. Well, they're trying to attract the um the the, the highest quality of brains. Yeah. You know, that's why there's such a, a huge expat community there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, even more so nowadays, you know, in, in the past, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore were both viewed as like the gateways to Asia. Yeah. I think, you know, it's probably now like given everything that's going on in Hong Kong at the moment, um, Singapore is probably viewed even more as the stable alternative. Yeah. You know, and so a lot of businesses want to, want to, want to um, set up shop there as their gateway to Asia through Singapore. Absolutely. Yeah. And like Singapore has positioned themselves to be that. Yep. Like with their the airport, you can spend eight hours yep. there. That's it's, it's Air, airport's phenomenal. It's really they're, yep. they're they're really smart. Yep. Um, and and it's a great place to visit for me. Mm. Right. It's a great place to visit, but for me, to live. it wasn't a great place to live. Yep. Um, and I think part of that was the weather. Mm. It's very humid. <laughs> so humid. Yeah. But the majority really? of the time, you're in air conditioning anyway. Yeah, but then, like you you can you get sick easily from being in air conditioning all the time. Yeah. Because uh, just the air circulates, but yeah. I, I digress. It was um, like we would go to Thailand to cool down. Yeah. Like that's how humid it was <laughs> yeah. in Singapore. Um, it was crazy, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and b- 
because of that experience working for a startup, that was how I was, I think part of that was also how I was able to um, land this role with mm. Google Chromebook because mm. their, their mentality, even though they're a larger company now, their mentality is like startup mentality, mm. you know. Um, the Google Chromebook program is fairly new. Um, the brand itself is fairly new in the market in Australia. Yep. It's done pretty well in, in the US. It's done pretty well in, in, the, in the UK and other markets. Yep. Um, but now here in Australia, like we're, we're trying to build up that, that brand and build up that market. Um, yeah, and then everything that I'd learned from Singapore, all of the, like, the difficulty there. Mm. And let me just say, one of the things that I learned as well mm. is um, I remember being there and I messaged my parents, right? And I yep. said, I appreciate you guys so much more because you um, migrated to a country that you had no experience in. Yep. You, like you could barely speak the language. Mm. And like even though people speak English in Singapore, there is sometimes there is a language barrier. Yep. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciated that fully because going to Singapore into the workforce in Singapore, mm. also just trying to network and, and understand how, like the social it's norms. It's a different culture. Yeah, completely yeah. different culture, right? Um, Working hours are very different. Absolutely. The way they view work is very different. Yeah, absolutely. So trying to understand all that stuff was 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 new. And, and because I had gone through that, I could then appreciate what my parents had gone through. Mm. To like completely uproot themselves and then move to a different country. Yep. And then try to build a life there. Yeah. Which is so difficult. Did you... I guess when you went to Singapore, did you have a certain expectation of what you would achieve? Um, yes, I think so. And then, and so obviously, if, you know, when, when you set expectations and it, when you don't, you know, get to achieve the heights of what you wanted to achieve, mm. you know, that's obviously very demoralizing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, I, I guess the reason why I say that is because you know, when I, I view a lot of um, guys that come into the automotive industry, so sales guys t particularly, right, mm -hmm. where they have this certain expectation that, you know, they're going to come in and make money, right, and they're there to make money, yep. right, which, you know, when, you, when you're working in a commission-based industry, of course, like that's, that is a part of what you do, mm -hmm. but they've got the they, – they're thinking about – they're putting the, the cart before the horse, you know, um, mm. so I always view it as, and like whenever I, I, I interview guys that want to go into sales, I always say to them, you know, how long are you planning to be in this industry? You know, because if they if their idea is that they're going to make some good money for a couple of years and they're, and they're done, it's the wrong industry yeah. because what you're actually doing, um, sales is a byproduct of what you do, right? So what you actually do as a salesperson or a sales consultant, you're, you're developing relationships. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, trying to re-educate people because people just go, oh, I just want to make money. So mm -hmm. a lot of people go into a particular industry because they go, oh, I'm, I'm just here. To, I, I just want to make money to, and, and, um, to, to do the other things that you're passionate about. And which is fine. Like, you know, um, like martial arts has been a big thing for, for my life as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I, I always, I guess, I, I, would, I would say that I took a more balanced approach. So balanced in the sense that... Um, I, I, I like I, I you know um, I didn't go all in into martial arts. Mm. I was very obsessed with it, and 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 and, and I still am. Um, but I didn't go all in and say I'm going to quit my job and go for training full time. Yeah, right. I've kept a more balanced approach, and I viewed and 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 some of it was I didn't really have a choice because I was trying to um, retain a, a lifestyle because you know I had to basically pay my own bills and do all that sort of stuff because yeah. you know I had some issues with my parents. Um, and so, you know, I kept that more balanced approach of saying, okay, well, I'm going to work because that, what I do in, in work there is going to afford my lifestyle to do the other things that I really love and enjoy. Yeah. Right. And then sometimes, you know, I, I, I can get lost in the, in the trees as well. And I start to think, oh, you know, why am I doing, why am I still working in this industry when, you know, if my passion is this, I should go and do that. Mm. Right. But what I realize is that, you know, your your passion and your commitment to certain things can ebb and flow, right? Yes. Like it's not, there, there is no, um, there's no one, like it's very hard to say that your commitment to something is going to be consistent every day, every second, every hour on a year on year basis, mm. right? There are going to be good days. There are going to be bad days. Like that's the nature of everything that we do, mm -hmm. right? 
So then when it came to work, you know, like when I, I found that when I started to fall out of love with the automotive industry was when I focused on the wrong things, mm. you know? Um, so, you know, I went through a period in my career where I, I, I got to a level that I didn't think I was going to get to for another four years. And I got there four years before I planned to get there. Yeah. And so then I, that, that was, that, that created a shift in my own mentality about that. It's not just about um, the, the goal, right? Yeah. You can set the goal. If you achieve the goal, fantastic. I achieved the goal four years earlier than I planned to achieve it. Yeah. But the problem was I never set anything after that. Mm. I had no goal after that. I lost my way. So then I focused on the wrong things. So now I w- so at 28, I was a leader of a business um, the figurehead of a business, and I wasn't focused on my employees. I was focused on the bottom line. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so now, as an operator, I view that I'm 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 such a better operator now, having gone through that experience. Um, and that's what that's why I I, I can feel so motiva- motivated in what I do because I'm not focusing on the bottom line. The bottom line is an out output of what I do. Yeah. I focus on coming to work every day to be that little bit better, get that little bit better at what I do and motivate my team and develop my team to get that much better at what they do, mm. you know? And if I, if I sort of, you know, try and chunk it all down, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to improve people's lives, yep. right? And I'm doing it on a very, I guess, a, almost like a one-to-one basis, right? Yep. But I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that because I'm in this capacity at, at that dealership where I've got, you know, 30, 30 something staff whose lives I can directly impact, mm. whose families, you know, rely on the income that they receive yeah. from the work that they do, yeah. right? So, so I, I take that responsibility very seriously now. Whereas, you know, um, at 28, I was not ready for that responsibility. I focused on the wrong things, mm-hmm. you know, and I can look at that objectively and I go, I, I was, in comparison to wh- wh- where I feel like I am now in my career, I'm a much better operator, Yeah. right? But at the same time, I take that same mindset and that same drive um, from my working side to to take away any of the excuses on the martial arts side of things. Mm. You know, I can I should still be able to get you know achieve whatever heights that I want to achieve there without you know having to be full time in it because as I as I always say, how you do anything is how you do everything, mm. right? So you know, um, but I think that 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 comes now with like I don't have the baggage of expectation. Yeah. You know, so I just, you know, when I listen to your story about Singapore, I just wonder whether you, you, you place this unrealistic expectation on yourself that, you know, in a year you're going to achieve this. And when it didn't start to go the way that you wanted to, um, we falter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. Like I I can only see that in hindsight. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I, I think from a from a business perspective, like trying to be in a market, and and without any contacts, without any network, especially mm. the, the music industry is is one of the things. It's it's about who you know yep. as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that building that relationships, right? Those relationships, I um, I think I expected yeah way too much for myself within a year. Yeah. Um, like I could have I could have done I could have started the relationship building years before that or, yep. or or whatever. Um, and yeah, it started to be it started to feel like I didn't want to do that yeah. anymore. It wasn't as fun. Yeah. And definitely yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. And we talked about this on our, on our podcast on the cheat coders about like a passion project. Yeah. Right. Like um, a passion project is something that you do f- because you love it. Yeah. Um, and the story that I told on that one episode was that I was producing a track uh, for somebody mm. and like I, I technically done it well, mm. but then I was like, I don't care about this song anymore. Yeah. You know, and, and sitting there listening to it, I was like, I don't really necessarily want to listen to it anymore mm. because <laughs> I just want to get paid now. Like, yep. I don't, I don't care. Yep. And that made me feel bad because I was like, this is something that I grew up loving. Music is something that I grew up yeah. loving. And there wasn't anything to discover from that moment. Yep. Except that, um, and talking to more creatives and entrepreneurs, like you kind of have to continue to make that money. Yep. So sometimes there are projects that you won't you take on just because you need to pay the bills. Yeah, you won't necessarily yeah. care about it. Yeah, that's. What, I think that's also part of my worry with, with you know, delving into martial arts on a more full time basis. Mm. Is that you know when it, when there's no pressure for it to be about money, because I make I make money from what I do for work. Yeah. Right. I can I can be invested in it without any expectation. Yeah. 
right? And then I, you know, sometimes I guess maybe that's my, that that might be something that holds me back as well. Um, depends which way, from which perspective you view it. You know, yeah. you can view it as it, as it holds you back from going into it because um, you don't want to have that expectation of, of trying to drive an income from it. Mm. Um, or I can view it as, you know, it's um, doing things this way allows me to be more free because I, I don't have to drive an income from it. Yeah. You know? Um, so I don't think there's a, I don't, it's not to say that I, I don't think there's a right or wrong um, in, in any viewing of it. It's just, you know, on the, on the scales of gray, what is acceptable? You know, yeah. what is your acceptable threshold of how much you want to do a certain thing? Mm. But I don't want it to be, feel like it's work. Yeah. You know? Um, and so there's always that, you know, uh, I think for anyone, you know, if you got bills to pay, Mm. And then that is your sole income. It becomes work at some points. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting thing. And, and like I, I learned this, um, like working in this role for, for Google Chromebook, they, uh, my manager said to me one time, he's like, we, we're not, we're not saving lives, mm. but like you need to find what your motivation is. Mm. Like, what is it? And, and it's been said before, like you, if you set your heart on something, you can get it. Mm. right and so tapping into the emotional side of whatever that is is really really important mm. um and he for 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 my manager he said to me he was like for him his motivation is providing for he and his wife mm. you know that's his that's his that's motivation his driving factor yeah and so when he wakes up he's like this is why i'm doing this mm. you know this is i'm doing this for my wife and i because i love her and that's the emotional that's that's how he's so impactful and so um efficient or effective in his job yeah, he's driven driven right and i think like the way that you do anything is everything right mm. is if you for me martial arts is really like i, I love it mm. I, I enjoy it so much and i've also tried to put that into my work mm. like, why do i enjoy martial arts i enjoy it because the discovery mm. but also i want to be able to help people i want to be able to inspire people i want to be able to motivate people yeah and so now when I wake up and when I, tr when with everything that I do, I try to take it from that standpoint, that emotional standpoint of, okay, why am I doing this? Mm. What's the purpose of this? Yeah. Um, am I going to learn something from it? Am I going to help someone from this? Like why? Mm. And that's how I try to operate now mm. is taking it from that emotional point because like, why do it if you're not going to go all out? Yeah. Like, you know, and, like commit to it. Just yeah. Be the best that you can be. Yeah. Um, and I think I think it's really interesting. Like I love how this conversations come like full circle <laughs> with, <laughs> with a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I th I think yeah. If you ever if you ever stuck or um, if I was ev ever to go back in t in time or whatever and and think about that that one project that I was like, Ugh, I can't be bothered doing this anymore. Yeah. Um, and and I've had like a few projects like that since. But um, I would be like, okay, re-engage with why you love this. Re-engage with the emotion to it. Mm. Like why, why is it that you're doing this? Mm. And money is, 100% is of the time, money will not be a good enough motivator. Yep. Like, like there are times when, like people do jobs just to get the money, as they say. Yep. But it's like, what is the emotional like core to this? Yep. Why, why, did you, why did you even choose to do this job in the first place? Yep. What, what made, made you even think of that? Yep. And um, like for me, because like this job is that discovery, that, yeah. that iterative learning. And I think um, most businesses, but I feel like sales mm. um, is very, very iterative. Like you have to like look at your weekly numbers. You have to look at your monthly numbers, yeah. quarterly, et cetera. You need to kind of reassess at particular points in time. And then you need to move in a direction that will help you reach those goals if you're not if you're not reaching them yeah. if you're not on target what are you going to do to, to hit to target it. yeah and if you're if you are on target or exceeding target let's move the goal first let's yeah. like move it to a higher thing so that we can create more and we can achieve more and we can get better yeah every single time um so yeah i, I think and again like <laughs> coming full circle with that moving yeah moving um the goal post i love that I, i'm i'm trying to uh be more comfortable with changing things yep. to be better. Yeah. Because you can get to a particular point in your life where you are good at something, mm. right? 
But then in order to be better, like you said, very beginning of this podcast, like take away that structure and yeah. then you need to adapt and you need to change yeah. and do something yeah, else. Take away the goalposts and just enjoy the ride for what it is. Yeah. You know, I think that's, um, you know, um, that's one of the things that, you know, if I can, if for my, for my team, you know, like at the end of the day, um, and this is actually a BMW thing, like one of the things that they really focus on, you know, what, what are we delivering when we're delivering a motor car? Yeah. Right. And so I, I guess, you know, th- their core sort of theme is we're trying to deliver joy, right? Mm. Because you could buy any car, right? There's many different brands of cars out there. Yeah. Um, but the whole idea behind, I guess, you know, why we, why we're, why we're motivated to, to, to um, sell the products that we sell and represent the products that we represent mm. is because at some point, you know, we, we hope to deliver joy to that customer or that yeah. guest, right? And so, and that's why, you know, um, going back to what I was saying about sales guys, you know, it's the first year is, is going to be your toughest year mm. because you don't have any pre-existing relationships. Mm. You might've worked in a different brand. You might've worked somewhere else, but you, ha- you, you haven't built up your clientele in that particular brand. Yeah. Right. And a lot of the times in, in our industry, and, and this is a, this is actually a, a shortfall of the automotive industry in general is that. Because of the pressures on tar- for for guys to achieve targets and things like that, um, you know, we, we get to a point where you know, let's say a guy does really well for his first year and then he falls over in his second year. Mm. He just lost his way, or something's changed in his in how he's approached things, or you know, um, he might have something happening in his personal life. Yeah. And then before you know it, that 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 guy probably doesn't last his second year. Mm-hmm. And then that third year, when people you know were, were starting to come back as referrals to replace their existing cars and things like that, that's all gone. Yeah. Right. Whereas, you know, so I always view it as from that, from that people equation, yeah. you know, um, I'm comfortable with my guys to have that personal relationship with their clients mm-hmm. because if I then lose them as salespeople in my team, that's on me. That's my failing, right? Because obviously I didn't recognize the value that they had yeah. or I didn't um, nurture yeah. that, that value of theirs to then allow them to keep doing that and keep them motivated to keep doing that, yeah. you know, in my team. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I always I always view it from from that perspective. Um, yeah, man, we've we've just like smashed out a couple of hours just like that. It's gone it's gone really quick. So I wasn't sure like how long you wanted to talk for. Oh no no well yeah well like usually I try and pull it up at the two hour mark. So it's a long podcast, but <laughs> hey, there's plenty of gems in this, guys. <laughs> um, so uh, for everybody listening, one more time, Don. If people want to find you, how do they find you? Yeah, you can find me um, www.dondoingstuff.online or on Instagram at Don Doing Stuff, Facebook, Don Doing Stuff. Um, yeah, check me out on there. Or also check me out on the Cheat, Cheat Coders, Coders pod- yep. podcast. Yep. Uh, www.thecheatcoders.com. On Instagram, The Cheat Coders. Uh, on Facebook, The Cheat Coders podcast. We're on Spotify and um, Apple Podcasts as well. Yeah, that's the way. Yeah, man. Who are you guys using for your uh, hosting platform? Uh, we use uh, Podbean. Podbean, okay. Yeah, so we... we uh, distribute through them and they, they they put it everywhere they put it everywhere yeah yeah, yeah. how, how cra- did you see that thing about joe rogan's hundred million dollar yes signing to i heard about Spotify? it yes there's, there's okay so while i'm talking about this i have to talk about this meme i saw this meme come up the other day and and um it, it's it's on instagram basically the top of it says you know uh what what does what did joe rogan do with his 100 million dollars and then there's <laughs> somebody's found some clip where Joe's sta- sitting next to this golden Buddha <laughs> and he goes, and here it is guys, the gold Buddha. <laughs> and I just started pissing myself laughing because of all things to spend your money on when you got a hundred million in the bank, a gold Buddha would be on the list. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I may, I may, I may do that. I may just do that <laughs> when I make my first hundred million for sure. <laughs> all right guys. Well, yeah, if you're listening to this, you obviously know how to find me. Um, but yeah, I am obviously on Instagram at Johnny Apps. And yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. This has been cool. Yeah, a lot of fun. Cheers. See you guys. Bye. Bye.